Hello and welcome to my limited set review for the Brothers War. So this review will focus on limited, meaning draft and sealed. The set review will also include the retro artifacts, which will be part of this limited format. So I'll discuss those at the end of this uh, video. But first, let's go over my grading system, split up into a few different tiers, and I'm using a letter grade system and taking some examples from the previous set, Dominaria United. An example of an S-tier level card is a card like Sphinx of Clear Skies, a card that can often win the game by itself. It will provide often an insurmountable advantage, and often one of the properties of an S-tier card as opposed to an A is that it has a bit of built-in protection. So even if the opponent does have an answer at the ready, it may not always be enough to uh, defeat this ridiculous bomb. Then at the A tier, we have cards like the Elder Dragon War, which can come down and act as a sweeper, make a 4-4 token, maybe give you some card selection as well. So these are cards that can also easily swing a game in your favor when you were behind. Cards like Drag to the Bottom, so another powerful sweeper, and sweepers and limited are typically quite powerful because the opponent doesn't always know to play around it, especially in a best of one environment, so these can easily swing a game in your favor. Then the B tier are still cards I'm very happy to first pick if we're playing a draft, for instance. So if I see a B tier level card like Knight of Dawn's Light, I'm very happy to first pick it. And then that will kind of guide me towards white as one of my colors. Of course, always good to be flexible in draft. But uh, yeah, a card like Knight is awesome as it's a fine card on turn two. And then in the late game still offers you some utility. So that's an important property of some of these B level cards. They often provide some sort of card advantage or they are just the best removal spells in each color. So often there's going to be one or two commons in each color. Often the removal spells in those colors that will also get a B grade. Cards like Extinguish the Light, just a very efficient removal spell that can deal with any opposing creature. Lightning Strike in this set would be another example of a fine removal spell that I would classify as a B. Then next we have the C plus category. These are still good playables. Cards you're very rarely going to cut from your limited decks. Uh, in the case of Vine Shaper Prodigy, that would apply if you're playing both blue and green. A fine two drop on turn two if you need to curve out, but also offers you some late game utility as you can kick it and maybe get an extra card out of it. So these are cards you're very happy to take relatively early in the pack if you're already committed to these colors. And another example, Griffin Protector, Flyers will often kind of get a higher grade, especially if they're relatively efficiently statted. Griffin Protector can easily take over and win you a game if there's a board stall. Then the C tier is going to be most of the cards in Limited. Filler cards, sometimes they'll make the cut, sometimes they won't. Uh, combat tricks I'll often classify as a C, just cards that you want maybe one or two of in your deck, but you don't want to overdo it, so you typically don't need to prioritize them during the draft. Furious Bellow being an example of a combo trick. And then other filler cards, cards like the Scavenger here, that's just a fine creature to play on turn three, provides a bit of card selection, but not a card I'm going to go out of my way to pick early. Can usually wield these too. Then we've got the D tier. These are cards that very rarely will end up making the final cut of your deck. There will be some maybe very specific circumstances in which I will play them, but for the most part you're unhappy to include these in your draft decks, and uh, I guess sealed as well. So Lenoir Stalker, just not very impactful, especially if you draw it later in the game. And Vanquisher's Axe, sometimes equipment can be playable if they're efficiently costed. The Vanquisher's Axe at first glance doesn't seem all that bad, but especially in Dominaria United, there were so many other ways to spend your mana on uh, kicker cards, for instance, that you often didn't have time to equip a Vanquisher's Axe. So that also ended up being a bad filler card, even though it could have been playable in other sets. And then an example of an F tier card. These are often cards meant for constructed. Maybe they have to do with planeswalkers, which you're not often going to see in limited. Cards like Urza assembles the Titans, just not a card you're going to consider in uh, limited. So it's usually going to go very late in the draft. And unless you want to rare draft it, you're not going to really think twice about it. So this is just a quick overview of my letter grade system that I'll be employing here during the set review. 
And then I also want to let you know that if you don't want to sit through the whole set review and you just want a handy spreadsheet with all the card ratings in one place, then uh, you can do so by becoming a Patreon supporter or a Twitch subscriber, and then you'll have access to all my limited spreadsheets for the Brothers War, but also all the other sets that have appeared on Arena. And I'll try and keep these spreadsheets up to date, because of course I'm giving all these cards a rating right now, but I'm sure as I play the set more and I get a bit more experience with the format, some of these ratings will slightly change, so those will also be reflected in these spreadsheets that are available for my subscribers and Patreon supporters. Then it's time to do a quick archetype breakdown. I like to do these as kind of a way to start out, to give you an idea of what all the two-color pairs are all about in the set, starting with blue-white, which is soldier tribal in the set. There will be quite a few uncommons and rares especially that will reward you for having lots of soldiers in play. Then red-white is kind of your typical go-white aggro deck. Um, nothing too special here. Blue-black, on the other hand, has a few interesting mechanics, cards that reward you for drawing a second card each turn. So picking up enough enablers, cards that let you draw cards, especially at instant speed, will be important for the blue-black archetype. Then black-green, as usual, cares about the graveyard, so there will be some cards that mill cards and put cards in your graveyard, and uh, some other cards that can sort of play off of that. Then red-green, kind of just an aggressive beatdown deck, so Stompy is what it's called. And then blue-red, as usual, cares about casting non-creature spells. In this case, also cares a bit about artifacts. And then black-white cares about graveyard recursion, especially cards that have mana value 3 or less. You'll see a bit of a theme, cards that want you to get back those uh, cheap creatures from the graveyard. So it's important to have some quality 2 and 3 drops to get back from the graveyard. Then red-black has a bit of a sacrifice theme. It's not as pronounced as in some previous uh, sets, but there is still kind of your typical act of treason with the sets mechanic attached, and then a few cards that let you sacrifice other permanents. So always uh, be on the lookout for those synergies in red-black. Then a green-white just cares about artifacts and plus one counters, but uh, also not the most pronounced theme, I would say. And then blue-green, on the other hand, has quite a few cards that generate these Power Stone tokens, which you may recall from Dominaria United, Karn, the Living Legacy, making those tokens. And these are artifact tokens that enter the battlefield tapped, and they can generate a colorless mana, but we cannot cast any normal creatures with this uh, colorless mana. We can, in fact, only cast artifacts, or we can use this mana to pay for abilities. Blue-green has the highest density of kind of Power Stone generators, but pretty much every color will uh, have quite a few cards that generate these Power Stone tokens, which will be a very important part of this limited format. There's quite a few expensive artifacts that will uh, often end up deciding the outcome of a game, so it's important to have lots of ramp to get those in play. Now let's take a look at the multicolor cards first, as that will kind of reinforce these archetypes, and that will give us a better picture of uh, the remaining set once we evaluate the individual colors. So starting out here, we've got the Vanguard Aviator, blue-white, 3-2, a legendary human soldier with flying at rare, saying, whenever you attack with five or more soldiers, creatures you control get plus one plus one and gain flying until end of turn. So as we've discussed, the blue-white cares about soldiers, soldier tribal, and this is a pretty good card in that archetype. There will be quite a few cards that also make soldier tokens, so it's not impossible to get to five attacking soldiers, but uh, for the most part we're evaluating the aviator as a two-mana 3-2 flyer with a little bit of upside, and as such we'll give it a B grade. Definitely a card I'm happy to take relatively early, and then, uh, of course, it gives us a good incentive to draft the Blue-White Soldier's archetype, especially if we can pick up a few more synergies. Next is Urza, Lord Protector. So we start out with a banger here. Three mana, two for Legendary Human Artificer at Mythic, so you're not going to see it very often. It says Artifacts, Instance, and Sorceries you cast cost one generic a less to cast. So pretty useful ability in a set with lots of expensive artifacts especially. And then for 7 mana, it has an activated ability that also mentions another card, since this is one of these meld cards, a mechanic 
that we have seen in the past and it's uh, coming back here on three different sets of cards and Urza is one of them and the other card that Urza synergizes with is the Might Stone and Weak Stone, a five mana legendary artifact which also has a Power Stone subtype and when it enters the battlefield we get to either draw two cards or give a creature minus five minus five until end of turn and then also taps for double colorless and this mana cannot be spent to cast non-artifact spells so again we're going to use it to cast artifacts for the most part and activate abilities so we can use the might stone and weak stone to pay for urza's seven mana ability in fact we can play urza on turn three play the Might Stone and Weak Stone on turn 4 thanks to the discount and then turn 5 we could already activate for 7 mana and melt them together to transform into the mighty Urza Planeswalker. Now this is very rarely going to happen in Limited since it's a rare and a mythic so chances of drafting both and then also drawing both and activating it are very slim but if you get to do it, achievement unlocked and this card will easily win you the game. Not going to spend too much time talking about all the abilities. You can check out my uh, top 25 cards in standard video where I go over this uh, pair as well. Urza Lord Protector will get a C+, just a fine card that will give you a bit of a discount. But uh, again, it's not going to happen very often that you get to melt the pair. Next we have Urza, Prince of Krug, 4 mana, 2-3, a legendary human artificer at rare, saying artifact creatures you control get plus 2 plus 2, and for 6 mana we create a token that's a copy of target artifact we control, except it's a 1-1 one, one soldier creature in addition to its other types. So very powerful ability if you get to activate it a few times. Of course the 1-1 one, one token won't stay a 1-1 one, one if we control Urza as it's going to get plus 2 plus 2. So a very powerful effect if you can keep activating it over and over. Can also make use of the Power Stone tokens to activate this ability. So Urza, Prince of Krug gets an A. Definitely better and limited than the Mythic Rare counterpart. Then we've got Yotian Tactician, 4 mana, 3, 4 at Uncommon, Human Soldier, saying other soldiers you control get plus 1 plus 1. So kind of the staple payoff card for the Blue-Eyed Soldier's archetype as a nice Anthem effect. So this will be another one of those key cards to push you into the Blue-White archetype. So Yotian Tactician will get a B, definitely a high pick card. Next we take a look at the blue-black with Evangel of Synthesis, a 2-mana, two 2-3, two, and when it enters the battlefield, draw a card and then discard a card. So it lets us loot, and it can sort of enable itself in a way. As long as you've drawn two or more cards this turn, the Evangel gets plus one plus zero and has menace. Of course, enabling itself the turn you play, it's not super relevant since it doesn't have haste, but could be good in multiples. And as we've mentioned, blue-black is the archetype that cares about drawing two cards in the same turn. So this can be an enabler for other cards that care about drawing two in the same turn. So the Evangel is a fine card, not a particularly high pick, but at the very least a C+, you're never going to cut it from your blue-black decks as just an efficient 2-drop with a bit of upside. Next we take a look at the red-black with a Junkyard Genius 3-mana 2-2 two, two. at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, create a tapped Power Stone, and as we've mentioned, these can tap for a colorless, they enter the battlefield tapped for the most part, and that mana cannot be spent to cast a non-artifact spell. So we're casting artifacts, we're activating abilities, and we can also pay one, a black and a red, and sacrifice another creature or artifact, including potentially the artifact token. And until end of turn, other creatures we control get plus one plus so and gain menace and haste. So applies to all other creatures, so it could be a nice mana sink and maybe a way to push extra damage. After we've made a few power stone tokens, we can maybe sacrifice them to get more benefit out of them. But uh, just the fact that the Genius is a 3-drop that makes a Power Stone token and helps us ramp into all these expensive artifacts that we'll see later is already quite good. So I'm happy giving the Genius a C+, kind of verging on a B almost. Then we have Mishra, claimed by Gix. This is the other one of these uh, Melt pairs, as they're known. A 4-mana, 3-5 at Mythic, Legendary Phyrexian Human Artificer. And says, whenever you attack, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life for X is the number of attacking creatures. So even if you're not attacking with Mishra himself, he can have an impact on the game. And then the card that pairs with Mishra, we'll also take a look at here, is the Phyrexian Dragon Engine. A 3 mana 2-2 two, two artifact creature Phyrexian Dragon at rare with double strike. 
and when the engine enters the battlefield from your graveyard, which you can accomplish thanks to Unearth, which is the first sighting of this ability, uh, an ability we have seen before. In this case, it's three and double red to unearth the dragon engine, so it will enter the battlefield from the graveyard. You're not casting the dragon engine, this is an ability, so that can be relevant for some cards. And then at the end of your turn, you have to exile the dragon engine if it leaves the battlefield as well. So can only get one attack in with the dragon engine of course also gets haste if you unearth it so you can maybe still swing for four and more importantly if this enters the battlefield from our graveyard we may discard our hands and if we do draw three cards so that's a great ability if you're empty-handed as you'll get to essentially just draw three in addition to maybe getting an attack in so we do need the dragon engine alongside mishra to melt the pair and so if we had to rate Mishra individually, even without the Dragon Engine, this card is pretty strong as a 3-5 or 4 that can drain the opponent. And then the Dragon Engine itself is also quite strong, but we'll rate this once we get to the artifact. And if we get to attack with both at the same time, we get Mishra lost to Phyrexia, which is a 9-9 with a ton of powerful abilities. Whenever it gets to attack or when it enters the battlefield, it does come into play tapped and attacking. So you don't get the attack trigger when it enters, but you do get the enter the battlefield ability. So that kind of makes up for it. And then you get to choose three abilities out of the six here. So that will decimate the opponent if you ever get the chance. But again, a mythic and a rare very difficult to assemble in limited, but I discuss these further in my standard video. Next we have Mishra, Tamer of Makfawa, a 5 mana 4-4, four, four, legendary human artificer at a rare. So this is uh, the rare counterpart of Mishra as we had with Urza as well, and has a ward, sacrifice a permanent which applies to all permanents you control. So if the opponent's got a bunch of spot removal in hand, they're gonna maybe take out Mishra, but it's gonna cost them another permanent, meaning potentially a land or maybe a power stone that they can sacrifice. Still a pretty good ability. And then each artifact card in your graveyard has Unearth for one, a black and a red. So plenty of artifact creatures in this set that you can unearth with Mishra. So a pretty powerful ability. And then a five mana four four with that protection from Ward is also quite good. So the Tamer here gets an A grade, definitely a bomb level card, and will work quite nicely in kind of a red-black sacrifice deck. And next is the Loyal Bodyguard, two mana in red-green for a 3-3 legendary human soldier at rare, and we can sacrifice the bodyguard at any point, and then legendary creatures we control get plus one plus so and gain indestructible until end of turn. So fine card by itself as a 3-3 for two mana if we can cast it on curve to this. And then not too many other legendary creatures in the set that we can protect, mostly relevant for constructed. But as far as limited is concerned, this is at the very least a C+, not a card I'm ecstatic to first pick. But if I'm already in red-green, then this card is great. Arbalist Engineers, a 3-mana 2-2 two -two at Uncommon, Human Artificer. And when it enters the battlefield, we get to choose one between three different modes. Can either deal one damage to any target, maybe take out a one toughness creature, can put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, including itself. It gains trample and haste until a turn. So it can be a 3-3 three, three trample haste when it enters, which is pretty strong. Or we can also just create a tapped power stone token. So lots of flexibility here. And uh, overall, happy giving the engineers a B grade. It seems a little bit better than the red-black counterpart, even though they could be almost the same. Um, but the flexibility here of maybe dealing one damage, maybe getting that counter, trample and haste can be quite relevant. But uh, also just happy making a power stone token and ramping into bigger things. So great card to pick early and kind of cement you in a red-green. Next is the Serinth Great Worm, 6 mana, 7-6 seven, at Mythic, a worm with trample and says whenever a land enters a battlefield, create a tapped Power Stone token. Now you might be wondering, why do I still need Power Stone tokens if I already had six mana to cast a Great Worm? And that is a legitimate question, but there are actually some eight, even ten mana artifact creatures in this set. So actually getting from six mana, playing a land and jumping to eight, maybe ten mana with two lands, is still useful since there's plenty of mana sinks. So normally you would look at the Great Worm and say this is just kind of a glorified Colossal Dreadmaw, but in the set those Power Stone tokens actually still matter. So while not 
necessarily the best mythic ever. I think the Great Worm is still worthy of at least a B grade. And it also counts opposing lands entering the battlefield, good point. So that also adds onto the uh, Power Stone tokens you can generate. Next is the Yotium Dissident, 2 mana, 1-1 one, one human artificer at uncommon. Says whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature you control. So if Power Stone enter, you can get a plus one counter, plenty of other artifact tokens, even soldier tokens that are artifacts that can uh, trigger the dissident. Some cards are artifacts themselves making an additional token, so you can maybe get two counters out of it. Plenty of synergy with the dissident if you kind of build your deck around it, and then this could be a great payoff. Willing to give this a B grade card I'm happy to pick early and sort of build around. Then we've got Legions to Ashes, one a white and a black for a rare sorcery, saying exile target no land permanent an opponent controls, and all tokens that player controls with the same name as that permanent. So for the most part just exiles one card, but sometimes the opponent will have a bunch of tokens that you're rather uh, interested in exiling, and then this could also help you out. So just a fine removal spell, nothing too special, but uh, still at least a B. Then there's Hero of the Dunes, 5 mana, 3-2 uncommon, human soldier, and uh, as we've mentioned, this cares about cards with mana value 3 or less, because when a hero enters, we can return an artifact or creature with mana value 3 or less from our graveyard to the battlefield, and creatures we control with mana value 3 or less also get plus 1, plus 0. Oh. So yeah, if you've got a bit of a graveyard sub-theme, maybe a few cards at mill, a few cards at sacrifice, and uh, just creatures trading in combats can help you enable the hero. So ideally a black-white deck would have a relatively low curve, lots of 2 and 3 drops, and then maybe a couple of heroes to kind of top off your curve to make sure you have enough uh, synergy with it. So yeah, in the right deck I could see this being a B as well. Then there's the third path Iconoclast, 2 mana, 2 1 human monk at uncommon, saying whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one colorless soldier artifact creature token. Okay, so non-creature spell includes artifacts, includes instance sorceries, but even enchantments and planeswalkers, so pretty broad range. And making a 1-1 one, one token is a pretty significant upside, and it doesn't take too much work to get this going. So the Iconoclast seems great, and a card I'm definitely happy to pick early and build my blue-red decks around, so it gets a B. Then we have Sahili, Filigree Master, our first true planeswalker here. Four mana, three loyalty, and can plus one to scry one, and we may also tap an untapped artifact we control if we do draw a card. And conveniently, Sahili makes artifacts with a minus two, makes a pair of one one Thopter artifact creature tokens with flying, and they also gain haste until end of turn. So Sahili is quite nice when uh, played on turn four, can apply a bit of pressure with the flying thopters, but you can also sit back, maybe use the thopters to protect Sahili, and then gain extra card advantage with the plus one. And the minus four is actually quite achievable, just play Sahili plus one, next turn you could already minus four if you wanted to, to get an emblem saying artifact creatures you control get plus one plus one, and artifact spells you cast get a one mana discount. So yeah, Sahili seems like a bomb level card here, gets an A, and uh, definitely an incentive to go blue-red. Skyfisher Spider is next, 4 mana in black green for a 3-3 spider at uncommon, has a reach, and when the spider enters the battlefield you may sacrifice another creature, specifically says creature, not permanent, so sadly cannot sacrifice power stones to it, and then when you do destroy targets non-land permanent, so quite a powerful ability, so ideally black green has a few random 1-1 creatures laying around that it can sacrifice, and then when the spider dies, you may gain one life for each creature card in your graveyard, and if you do, exile the spider from your graveyard. So as we mentioned, black-green cares about the graveyard, we'll have a few cards that mill additional cards into the graveyard to maybe synergize with the spider as well. So this seems like a great build round for black-green, and spider gets a B as well. Next is the Death Bloom Ritualist, 5 mana, 3 5 Elf Warlock at rare, and it taps to add X mana of any one color where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Okay, so this could easily get out of hand, 
and a card that helps you ramp in the set is worth more than in a regular set because as we've mentioned there are eight even ten mana artifacts you can cast so the extra mana going from five to eight or nine is actually quite relevant so yeah if you can enable the ritualists if there's enough creatures in the graveyard this could be a very important card to help you set up for the late game so a ritualist also gets a b not quite a bomb level card since by itself it doesn't win you the game but it's an amazing enabler if you've got more cards to go with it then we have a queen akela three mana two three in red white and has a pretty weird ability pay four tap it and then discard all the cards in your hand and draw that many and then you may choose an artifact or creature card with mana value one that we've discarded this way and then do the same with mana values two and three and then return those cards to the battlefield and can only be used at sorcery speed so i guess the idea is once you get to the mid to late game you draw a few of your one and two drops that you don't really care about they're not that impactful anymore and then you can still kind of discard them for value since you'll still be able to put them in play and draw extra cards don't know if that's going to happen very often since for the most part we're going to try and play those one and two drops on curve so how many more are you going to have in hand by the time you activate this but you can still of course discard lands to the ability which uh, if you're not interested in casting those eight or nine mana spells having uh, a way to discard lands to draw more action could be useful so still a fine card but um, nothing special not a card i'm going to go out of my way to build around necessarily but a C plus if you're already red white you're very happy with this and probably never going to cut it from your red white decks next is the vanguard four mana two three human soldier at uncommon has first strike and when the vanguard or another creature enters battlefield under your control target creature gets plus two plus so until end of turn okay so this wants you to generate a few tokens to get the most out of it and uh, yeah the turn you play it you can already pump something else and attack with it for two extra damage will pair very nicely with evasive creatures especially if you can just uh, give one of your flying creatures additional power makes it difficult for the opponent to block so it just translates into extra damage to the opponent and then the fact that it has first strike if you get this up to four power it's going to be very difficult for the opponent to block profitably so the vanguard seems like another great build around and gets a b next is the battery bearer four mana three four human artificer at uncommon in blue green and says creatures you control can tap to add colorless this mana similar to power stones cannot be spent to cast a non-artifact spell and then whenever you cast an artifact spell with mana value six or greater draw a card so this card seems amazing to me turning all your creatures into mana creatures to help ramp out all those expensive blue and green artifact creatures of which there are many trust me uh yeah the bearer seems great both uh, draws you cards and generates mana at the same time so i'm even willing to give this an a bomb level card somewhat similar to the death bloom ritualist which is a rare but this kind of does it better at four mana and it's an uncommon next is tonos the toy maker five mana three five human artificer at rare in blue green and says whenever you cast a beast or a bird creature spell you may copy it except that the copy is an artifact in addition to its other types now i've kind of looked at how many birds and beasts there are in the set and there's not very many of them and they're not even necessarily in blue green so tonos sadly is not quite gonna be an amazing build around in limited i'm sure it will make for a fun commander but as far as limited is concerned gets a d and then there's Tokasia dig site mentor one a white blue and green so banned colors for a 4-3 human artificer at rare and says creatures you control have vigilance and can tap to surveil one surveil is back now kind of an evergreen keyword and to surveil means you look at the top card of your library and you may put that card into your graveyard or of course you can keep it on top instead so it gives us a nice bit of card selection somewhat similar to scry but has additional graveyard synergy so it's typically better and then we can also pay two double green double white double blue we can exile tokasia from our graveyard and then return any number of artifact cards with total mana value 10 or less from our graveyard to the battlefield so yeah nice ability if uh, tokasia eventually ends up in our graveyard 
of course the big hurdle is going to be having access to all three of these colors in limited which is not going to be easy there's maybe a few shortcuts if you happen to open a chromatic lantern as we'll get to with a retro artifact but uh, for the most part there's not a ton of mana fixing in this set it's not really meant to be a three color set so casting the dig side mentor is going to be the main challenge so i wouldn't recommend building around it but if you're already two of the three colors maybe happen to pick up a few mana fixing pieces then this could be a great addition to your deck but i'm gonna give it a c to start out so first white card on our list is a laid down arms one mana for an uncommon sorcery and this is a bit of a cycle in the set of cards that care about being a monocolor deck as they get better the more basic lands of a certain type you have in this case exile target creature card with mana value less than or equal to the number of planes you control and its controller gains three life so pretty efficient removal spell especially if your deck is mono white and uh, could still be effective in a two color deck let's say it's turn five or six you've got three planes in play can still exile a three drop with uh, just one mana which is quite efficient the three life not a huge drawback for the most part so yeah could see this being pretty effective but definitely going to be at its best in a monocolored mono white deck as then it will scale very nicely into the late game and might even be able to exile some of the more expensive cards so i don't think this is a card you necessarily want to pick incredibly early so this is somewhere between a, a c and a c plus and yeah i might actually go up to a c plus for lay down arms the fact that it still works outside of mono white makes me more interested in this than some of the counterparts in other colors and next is loran's escape one mana comma trick here instant at common saying target artifact or creature gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn and we also get to scry one so yeah fine trick if you're interested in protecting a creature the problem quote unquote with this card is that it doesn't make your creature bigger so it doesn't help you necessarily trade up for an opposing creature so it's mostly a defensive trick or it can help you trade for a creature that's more or less the same mana value as the one you're targeting but i wouldn't go out of my way to take this highly can probably wheel it and i also wouldn't play more than one or two copies in my deck so it gets a c next is meticulous excavation and as you may have noticed here i'm doing something a little bit different from previous set reviews i'm going in the order of mana value so we're starting with the cheapest cards and then going up the curve as opposed to going in alphabetical order or set number order as it makes a little bit more sense getting kind of a sense of what the curve in these different colors might look like so now we've got uh, excavation a one mana uncommon enchantment and for two and a white we can return a target permanent we control to its owner's hand and if it has unearth instead exile it which is a little strange here but it's just a way to make sure you can actually get the unearth card back in your hand and then uh, can only be activated during our turn cannot use it during the opponent's turn so it's not like you can chum block with a creature and then pick it back up to keep preventing the opponent from hitting you so maybe good with some enter the battlefield abilities that you can reuse but um, yeah i'm not super interested in the excavation so i'm gonna give it a d there might may, maybe some interesting combos with it but in your average deck i don't think you want excavation and next is military discipline one mana enchantment aura at common it has flash so it's kind of like a comma trick that sticks around it enchants one of your creatures giving it plus one power and when the discipline enters the battlefield the enchanted creature also gains first strike until end of turn so yeah as far as combo tricks go it's nice that this one sticks around now it's still not the most impactful card necessarily so wouldn't go above a c grade for it but uh, yeah between this and the trick we've just uh, discussed not sure which i prefer kind of depends on the deck this might be slightly better in a more aggressive deck where you're looking to push through damage and you'll be attacking more often but first strike is still pretty good on defense as well and then uh, the other trick might be better at protecting a more uh, impactful creature if you will so well, we'll go with a c for discipline next is recruitment officer one mana to one human soldier at uncommon 
So fine to play early as a way to apply a bit of pressure. Soldier, a relevant creature type, as we know. And then also has a four mana activated ability, letting us look at the top four cards of our library. And we may reveal a creature card with mana value three or less from among them and put it into our hand. So again, kind of fits nicely in a blue-white soldier's deck. Also goes well into a black-white deck that cares about mana value three or less. Just a nice mana sink. But uh, you do need to make sure you have enough targets for the officer for it to truly shine. Probably worthy of a C+. Next is Survivor of Corliss. One mana, one one human soldier at common. Has first strike. And for one on white, we can exile the survivor from our graveyard to scry two. Okay, scry two, I guess is a nice ability to have access to in the late game. Problem is, do we really want a one mana, one one first strike? There's a few ways to maybe increase its power, but it's not like there's a wealth of equipment in this set or auras that we can put on the survivor. So yeah, unless we're a dedicated soldier tribal deck, I don't think I really care about the survivor, so we'll give it a D. Next is Ambush Paratrooper, 2 mana, 1, 2 human soldier at common, has flash and flying. So okay, can maybe ambush a small creature, but it also has an activated ability for 5 mana, saying creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. Okay, so that's not a bad mana sink once you have a few creatures out. This has the threat of activation to pump your creatures, making it awkward for the opponent to block. But of course, once you actually spend the mana, it can also translate into quite a bit of extra damage. And uh, a 1 2 flyer for 2, also not the worst. So has lots of nice additional uh, upside. Not sure if it's quite worthy of a C. Kind of depends how often you end up with a go white deck. And while there are a few ways to make tokens, doesn't seem as pronounced as in Dominaria United. So I'm leaning towards C for Paratrooper, but uh, definitely one I'm pretty happy to have in most white decks, unless it's more of a, a ramp deck that wants to cast expensive spells, in which case this is probably not really the effect we're looking for. Then there's Calamity's Wake, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is an F, probably a weird sideboard card for Constructed. Can't think of too many applications where I would want this in limited, even out of the sideboard. So we're just not gonna spend too much more time on it. Next is a deadly repost, a two mana instant at common, dealing three damage to target tapped creature, and we also gain two life. Now three damage can be relevant if the format was all about smaller creatures attacking and blocking. This set will have some truly enormous creatures that the repost is not gonna help you with. Yeah, I'm not super high on the repost. It's still probably a fine card to have, but also I could see this being pretty awkward. Let's say you're playing against a blue-green power stone ramp deck, then the opponent's probably not going to be attacking much with their smaller creatures. I guess it could maybe still take out a mana creature, since it doesn't have to be attacking or blocking, just a tapped creature. So yeah, I'll go with a C on the repost, but uh, could definitely have some matchups where it doesn't do anything. Next is Disenchant, and this is typically seen as a sideboard card in Limited, but for one and white at instant speed, this common can destroy an artifact or enchantment, and this set is filled with juicy artifacts especially, so this is very much a main deckable card. Remember maybe Theros, where you would also like Disenchant in the main deck since there were so many enchantments, this time it's mostly artifacts, and yeah, at instant speed, this is one of the better removal spells at common you can get. So easily gets a B, card I'm happy to take very early. And yeah, it's important to know the set before jumping into it, since typically you wouldn't really think much about Disenchant. But uh, in this set, it's definitely one of the higher picks in white. Next is Phalanx Vanguard, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two human soldier at common, has Vigilance, and says whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, the Vanguard gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. Okay, so it's a 2 mana 2-2 two, two with Vigilance with a bit of upside. So for a common, this seems fine. I'll give it a C. Not necessarily a card I'm thrilled about, but probably a fine filler card for most white decks. Then there's a Power Stone Engineer, 2 mana 2-1 two, human artificer at common. And when the Engineer dies, create a tapped Power Stone token. 
Okay, now we're talking. A two drop that also helps us ramp into our expensive late game. And uh, yeah, I'll give the engineer a C plus. This is actually a two drop I'm more excited about and one that I'm happy to trade off to get that Power Stone token going. Then there's a recommission, two mana sorcery at common, returning an artifact or creature card with mana value three or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. And if a creature entered the battlefield that way, it also enters with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. So this will be at its best in black white, where you might have a bit of overlap with self mill and graveyard synergies. And of course, you also care about mana value three or less. But uh, yeah, could still be a fine way to get back one of your more valuable three drops, especially and put a plus one counter on it. Still not a card I would want too many copies of in my deck since otherwise you run the risk of drawing recommission without having a creature to bring back. But seems playable enough, so we'll give it a C. And then there's Soul Partition, two mana instant at rare, and says exile target non-land permanent. For as long as that card remains exiled, its owner may play it and a spell cast by an opponent this way costs two generic more to cast. Okay, so there's a lot to parse here. At first glance, Soul Partition doesn't seem very good since the opponent can just replay whatever you get rid of. But I think the way to look at Soul Partition is as an improved bound spell, which we're not used to seeing in white. But uh, bear with me, you're basically going to use this to gain a tempo advantage in the game. Let's say the opponent taps out for their expensive 6 or 7 drop. Now you can soul partition and it's going to cost maybe 8 or 9 mana for them to replay it. So that might be a while and the game might be over before they actually get to replay it. But the fact that it's an instance, you could even use this on your own creature to save it from removal and then you won't have to pay the two additional mana because it only applies to an opponent casting it this way. So you can also just use it as a, a bound spell to kind of save your own creature. So it does have quite a bit of flexibility and uh, yeah, especially in an aggressive deck, this is going to be at its best. I would typically give this type of effect a C. I think Soul Partition with uh, additional tax and flexibility goes up to a C plus. Definitely not a very high pick, but in most wide decks I think I'm happy to play it even though you might disregard it at first glance. Next is Airlift Chaplain, 3 mana, 1-1 one, one Human Cleric at common, flies, and when it enters the battlefield you mill 3 cards, and you'll see there's a kind of a cycle of these commons that when they enter mill 3 cards, and they all work a little bit differently afterwards. In this case we may put a Plains card or a Creature card with mana value 3 or less from among the cards milled this way into our hand. If we don't, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the Chaplain. So we could just have a 3 mana 2-2 two, two flyer at all times, or we could have a 1-1 one, one flyer that either gets a land or a cheap creature. So quite a bit of flexibility, can maybe enable some graveyard synergies. So again, probably at its best in black-white, but also could just be a nice evasive creature to play in an aggressive deck. So yeah, fine role player I think in multiple decks, and might be worthy of a C+. Flyers could be an important way to close games, if lots of big creatures take over the ground. And then we've got a mythic here in the trenches, a three mana enchantment saying creatures you control get plus one plus one. So kind of your glorious anthem, but there's more. For six mana we can exile target non-land permanent we don't control until in the trenches leaves the battlefield, but we can only activate this once and at sorcery speed. So yeah, an Anthem effect that has additional upside in the late game, can use our Power Stone tokens to maybe pay for the 6 mana ability and get rid of an expensive card from the opponent. So this seems like a pretty powerful Anthem effect, especially in your red-white, go-white decks, but uh, pretty much any white creature deck is going to be happy with this, so I'll give it a B. Then we have a Chaos command, there will be a cycle of these commands in each color, this is a 3 mana a rare sorcery, letting us choose two modes between making a 2 2 construct artifact creature token, putting a plus one plus one counter on a creature we control, and it gains double strike until end of turn. Can search our library for a planes to put in hand, or we can gain two life and scry two. That's probably the mode that we're not going to use very often, but all three other modes are pretty useful. We could make a 3 3 um, for 3 mana, which is kind of the fail case here. 
but more often than not we're gonna give an existing creature that's already in play a plus one counter and double strike to get in a ton of extra damage in the early game maybe just a 2-2 two -two that finds a planes to make sure you keep hitting your land drops so quite a bit of flexibility and then in the late game the double strike and plus one counter especially on a flying creature could represent a ton of extra damage so a card that's never really dead and will always be quite useful so happy giving command a b grade as well then we have Kalos reconstruction x and triple white for a rare sorcery saying a look at the top seven cards of your library put up to x artifact and or creature cards with mana value three or less from among them onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom in a random order okay so we'll kind of have to do a bit of math here to figure out how good reconstruction is so let's say you're playing a pretty dedicated deck that has a ton of these two and three mana uh, permanents you can find with it even so looking at the top seven cards there might be three lanes among those seven cards there might be one non-creature spell maybe that uh, doesn't fit the description here so you know even in the best case scenario there might only be three targets among the top seven so then you start kind of doing the math if you cast this for x equals one you're not really getting ahead in the exchange if you cast it for x equals two you paid five mana to at best get maybe six mana worth of cards for x equals three if you get lucky i guess you can actually get a bit of an advantage so it just feels like a lot of hoops to jump through and the payoff isn't quite there so i don't think i'm really uh, interested in the reconstruction we'll give it a d but i could see some rare circumstances where it's actually worth it especially if you've got lots of three drops then we have a loran of the third path three mana to one legendary human artificer at rare has vigilance and when it enters the battlefield destroy up to one target artifact or enchantment so already i'm interested in a loran and can also tap and then you and target opponent each draw a card but uh, let's say we kind of cancel out that last line of text then this is still a great card in the set basically a reclamation sage with vigilance and uh, taking out artifacts and enchantments is hugely important in the set as i've uh, talked about with the disenchant and then there's additional synergy with this potentially coming back from the graveyard there's quite a bit of graveyard recursion for three mana creatures in this set so loran gets at the very least a b could even see this uh, going even higher but of course some opposing decks may not necessarily have the most high value artifacts and enchantments for you to take out in which case this is kind of a, a random card that's not going to do much but i expect most decks to have at least a handful of important artifacts and enchantments to take out and then the additional card draw whether you activate it or not kind of depends on the board state i guess but uh, even without it this card is great and next is prison sentence three mana enchantment aura at common enchants a creature and when it enters the battlefield you get to scry two so that's a nice bit of upside and then the enchanted creature cannot attack or block and its activated abilities cannot be activated okay so pretty decent removal spell in white it's only a single white to cast it so not too difficult could even be splashable in some circumstances and the scry 2 is definitely a nice upside especially if you ended up saving the sentence for an expensive creature so we're already kind of in the late game then the scry 2 to put lands on the bottom is quite relevant so yeah this card's pretty good as far as these removal spells go definitely one of the best versions of this we've seen in white and i'll uh, give it a b now of course there are a few risks when playing prison sentence the opponent could have a disenchant to get rid of it they might be able to sacrifice their creature for value or maybe bounce their creature back so it's not necessarily a permanent solution in every circumstance but uh, as far as white removal spells go this is still pretty good we'll give it a b siege veteran is next here three mana two two human soldier at rare saying at the beginning of combat on your turn put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control so kind of your luminarch aspirant at three mana and then whenever another non-token soldier you control dies create a one one colorless soldier artifact creature token and yeah we've already seen a lot of soldiers so far so this ability is quite relevant of course if the opponent has removal they're gonna likely take out the veteran first as it's probably the most important card on the battlefield 
but let's say the opponent's removal is a prison sentence and uh, there's other examples in blue cards that can keep creatures tamped down but uh, cannot get rid of the ability so yeah the veterans definitely a bomb level card that i'm going to give an a may seem a bit unassuming but uh, those plus one counters definitely add up and also has great synergy in a soldier tribal deck at three mana there's also multiple ways to get it back so it fits into pretty much every white archetype and next is Tokasia's Welcome 3 mana rare enchantment, saying whenever one or more creatures with mana value 3 or less enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card, and this ability triggers only once each turn. So reminiscent of Welcoming Vampire, works out a little bit differently, but uh, yeah, a great card to have if you can play it early and keep your curve nice and low, and basically draw two cards per turn if you can string together enough creatures. So this is a pretty strong card that I'm happy to take early and kind of push me towards those uh, low-curve white aggro decks. Union of the Third Path is a 3-mana instant at common, draws a card, and then you gain life equal to the number of cards in your hand. So a bit of an expensive revitalize, which I'm not very interested in. There's not a ton of life gain synergy in this set. Now, there are a few blue and black cards that care about drawing a second card in your turn, but at 3 mana this is kind of a clunky way to enable it, and it's also not in blue or black, so don't really see this working out very often. Give it a D. And then we have the Warlord's Elite, 3 mana, 4-4 four, four human soldier at common, saying as an additional cost to cast it, either tap two untapped artifacts, creatures, and or lands you control. So best case scenario, we can play this on turn 3 by just tapping a random creature or maybe an artifact that we played earlier. But more realistically, maybe play this on turn 4 by tapping an extra land and a creature. So yeah, 4 mana, 4-4 four, four in that case, still not bad. So the Elites seems like a pretty decent card for most white creature decks, and uh, I'll give it a C. Still needs a little bit of work to really get the most out of it. And if this is the first creature you cast, you're going to be disappointed. So, yeah, it does require a bit of setup, which is why it's not getting a C plus here. Then there's the Yotian Medic, 3 mana, 1 4 human cleric soldier at common with lifelink. So, yeah, reasonable stats for 3 mana. 1 4 blocks pretty well in the early game at least. So, we'll give this a C as well. Loran, Disciple of History, is next. 4 mana, 3-3 three, three legendary human artificer at uncommon. And when Loran or another legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. So, can be any artifact, even some of the more expensive ones. So yeah, Loran seems pretty good. You're probably not going to play it on turn 4 very often, but uh, more of a card you're gonna sandbag to maybe get back some more expensive artifact from the graveyard once the opponent answers it. And then if you're lucky enough to have a few legendaries, that could also synergize nicely. But uh, overall, Loran gets a C+. And then there's Murel or Mirel, Shield of Argive, 4 mana, 3-4 legendary human soldier at Mythic saying during your turn your opponents cannot cast spells or activate abilities of artifacts creatures or enchantments and whenever the shield of argive attacks create x 1 1 colorless soldier artifact creature tokens where x is the number of soldiers you control so perfect in your blue white soldier tribal deck but making those colorless soldier tokens will synergize across pretty much every white archetype Imagine this alongside the green-white uncommon that also adds plus one counters. That seems like a deadly combination. So yeah, pretty strong card for most white decks. A 3-4 won't always be able to attack unopposed, so ideally you can back it up with a few combo tricks, but at least with the first ability you don't need to fear any combo tricks from the opponent. So this gets a B at the very least, but I could see this sneaking up into the A bomb level category. Static Nets, 4 mana enchantment at uncommon, and when it enters the battlefield, exile targets non-land permanents an opponent controls until the Static Net leaves the battlefield. And then when the net enters the battlefield, you also gain 2 life and create a tapped power stone token. So you just keep getting more and more stuff here. So yeah, the Static Net seems awesome, 
Definitely a B level card. Great removal that gives you additional upside with that Power Stone token especially. Can certainly make a difference even if the opponent eventually answers your net. You're still going to be left with that extra Power Stone token. Then there's the Thopter Architect. 4 mana, 2-3 Human Artificer at Uncommon. Saying whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, target creature gains a flying until end of turn. So 4 mana is a bit much for a 2-3. So we're not necessarily getting the best stats. The situation where the Architect is going to be at its best is you're kind of in the late game already, there's a bit of a board stall, creatures can't really attack profitably, you play an Architect, and then best case scenario you can generate a few maybe artifact tokens and then give most of your team flying to kill the opponent out of nowhere. On the flip side, if you're kind of on the defensive, the opponent is beating you down, then a 4 mana 2-3 that Grand's Evasion is not really where you want to be. So, yeah, I'm not super high on the Architect, but I can definitely see situations where this could be one of the best cards out there. Overall, we'll land on a C for Architect. I'll take it or leave it. Then there's the Aeronaut Cavalry, as one of the curve toppers in white. 5 mana, 3-4 Human Soldier at common, it flies, and when the Cavalry enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on another target soldier you control. Plenty of soldiers to give that uh, plus one counter to. And yeah, 3 4 flyer for 5 mana is decent stats. In total, you get 4 power, 5 toughness. So that's a pretty good deal, especially for a common. So happy giving the cavalry a C. Plus. And then the Great Desert Prospector. 5 mana for a 3 2 human artificer at uncommon. And when it enters the battlefield, create a tapped power stone token for each author creature you control. Okay, so best case scenario, you played a 2 drop, a 3 drop, and a 4 drop, and then Prospector can uh, generate 3 power stone tokens. That's not bad, but of course, in the mid to late game, maybe you can make a few tokens as well then this can completely go nuts, and there's no shortage of mana sinks for the Prospector to uh, use those Power Stone tokens with. Now if this is only the second creature you've played, and it only makes one Power Stone token, then you're not really getting a great deal. So yeah, it does require a little bit of setup, and there's a bit of tension there. If your deck has lots of cheap enablers for the Prospector, it's going to have fewer expensive cards to sink all that mana into, so it's a bit of a balancing act but uh, I expect a Prospector to be a pretty important role player in uh, most white decks, so we'll give it a B. And then Repair and Recharge, 5 mana, Sorcery at Uncommon, returning an Artifact, Enchantment or Planeswalker card from your graveyard to the battlefield, and you also get to make a tapped Power Stone token. So pretty interesting take on the reanimation effect. Now important to keep in mind, even though it doesn't say creature, you can still get back artifact creatures because they satisfy the artifact part of it. So if you happen to mill one of those expensive artifacts, then this could be an easy way to cheat them into play on turn 5 already. Although there's not too many discard effects in this set, so you're mostly hoping to blindly mill those cards, which is not going to happen very often. So I'm not going to give this a very high grade, but uh, could still be a fun kind of combo piece in the right deck. Then there's Mass Production as our final white card, I believe. Six mana, uncommon sorcery, creating four 1-1 one, one Colossus Soldier Artifact creature tokens. So we're paying quite a bit for this effect, but truth be told, there are quite a few nice payoff cards for making all those 1-1 one, one tokens. Think of mostly the uncommons, maybe turn those four soldier tokens into four plus one counters. Maybe you've got an Anthem effect giving those soldiers plus one plus one. So there are quite a few synergies, uh, especially the 2-mana rare, the 3-2 flyer, that can uh, give the team plus 1 plus 1 and flying if you attack with 5 soldiers. Those are kind of the synergies I'm looking for with mass production. In an average deck where you maybe only have one of those payoff cards, I'm not super interested in mass production. 6 mana for 4 one ones doesn't seem amazing to me. And also another drawback, a 6 mana card that's not an artifact means we cannot use our Power Stone tokens to necessarily cast mass production. So that's also kind of awkward in the set where you would much prefer your expensive cards to be castable through Power Stones. So overall, I'm not super high on mass production, but I can definitely see scenarios where this could be one of the best cards in your deck if you have enough payoffs for it. 
So I'm going to start pretty low, give it a D, but I definitely recognize situations where it could be amazing. Okay, now I'm also going to cover the artifacts that have a white activated ability or some other uh, white ability that uh, warrants them being in the white category. So Yotian Frontliner is up next here, a 1 mana 1-1 one, one artifact creature soldier at uncommon, saying when it attacks, another target creature we control gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn, and we can also unearth it for a single white, so it will come into play as a 1-1 one, one with haste, and then end of turn we have to exile it, pretty much. So Frontliner, kind of a low impact card by itself, I could see situations where you're kind of just a very low curve aggro deck and you just want to get as many cheap creatures as possible. Maybe you've got a few anthem effects for soldiers and this could be okay. But uh, yeah, I'm going to have to give the frontliner a D here. I don't think it's particularly great. Next is Urza's Silex, 3 mana legendary artifact at Mythic Rare. And it's pretty similar to Karn's Silex from Dominaria. Four mana in this case, including two and double white, tap and exile the Silex. And then each player chooses six lands they control, destroy all other permanents, and can only activate it as a sorcery. And then when a Silex is put into exile from the battlefield, you can pay two generic mana. If you do, search your library for a Planeswalker card, reveal it and put it into your hand. Not very likely to find Planeswalkers in Limited to synergize with this, but it's still a sweeper, and sweepers, even though this one the opponent will see coming so they can sort of plan around it, it's still a, a powerful effect. You can maybe just chum block on the last turn that the opponent would maybe try and get some more damage in, and then just blow up the Silex and reset. Maybe you've left some of your better cards in hand to eventually take over. So. While not quite a bomb level sweeper, it's still at the very least a B, I think, similar to Karn Silex from Dominaria. Even though this one is not quite as flexible, since you can only really use it in a white deck. Then there's a Veteran's Power Blade, 3 mana equipment at common. Equipped creature gets plus 2 power, equips a soldier for just a single white mana, otherwise it's too generic. Equipment in this set, I'm kind of lukewarm on, since there's going to be so many more powerful things you can do with your mana, especially in the late game, that uh, I don't think giving a creature two additional power is going to be all that impactful, even though there might be some low-curve aggressive deck with lots of one-drops that just wants a way to get those cheap creatures in the red zone again by giving them a bit of extra power. Overall, I don't think a Power Blade is really worth it. Three mana is pretty expensive to cast this in the first place, even though the equip cost can be cheap. So I'll give it a D, but there's definitely situations where I might consider this as kind of my last card. Then there's a Scrap Work Cohort, 4 mana, 3-1 soldier at common, and when it enters a battlefield, create a 1-1 colorless soldier artifact creature token. Alright, so now we're talking 2 soldiers for 4 mana, 2 artifacts, so that has a, a lot of synergy already. So I much prefer the Scrap Work Cohort over the uh, 6 mana mass production in most decks, and it also has Unearth for 2 and a white, so we can bring it back, get maybe 3 extra damage in, and make an extra 1-1 one, one on the way out, and the 1-1 one, one can stay back to play defense, since the 1-1's one, not going to have haste, of course. So yeah, the cohort seems like a pretty important card for a lot of white decks, and I'm going to give it a C+. Then we have the Autonomous Assembler, 5 mana, 4-5 artifact creature assembly worker, and this is, I believe, the first sighting of the prototype ability. So normally the assembler would be a 5 mana 4-5 with vigilance, can pay 1 mana, tap it, to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target's assembly worker we control. So it can also target itself, which is important here, so we can attack with vigilance, and then there's the threat of activation that we could put an extra counter on it before damage. But this also has prototype, meaning we can also cast it for 2 mana here, 1 and a white, in which case it's a 2-2, two, two, and it still has all the other abilities, so it will be a 2-2 two, two with Vigilance, that can also put a plus 1 counter on an assembly worker. So this card seems great, especially the 2 mana version, if you can play it early, seems like a great way to apply pressure, but then in the late game if you draw it later, then uh, the 5 mana version is also pretty good. So. The flexibility here on prototype is quite nice, 
and uh, both versions are quite efficient and give you a pretty powerful creature I think so at the very least a B kind of verging on a bomb level but of course doesn't have any real built-in protection just kind of a big dumb creature at the end of the day and there's not that many other assembly workers that synergize with the assembler otherwise it may get an even higher grade and then there's a platoon dispenser five mana four six artifact creature construct at mythic saying at the beginning of your end step if you control two or more author creatures draw a card that seems like a very easy condition to meet just play a random three and four drop play platoon dispenser end of turn draw card and it's just going to keep drawing cards unless the opponent manages to answer the dispenser and if they don't we also get a nice activated ability that helps enable the first ability for four mana we can make a one one colorless soldier artifact creature token and then as if this weren't enough this card also has unearth now unearth is a little awkward on this since you would much prefer to keep the dispenser around to uh, leverage the card draw ability but at least with unearth we'll still get to draw one card on the way out assuming we have two other creatures and then a, a hasty attack for four on top of that so the dispenser definitely feels like a bomb level card that will take over the game if the opponent doesn't answer it and it's kind of an army in a can if it can uh, keep making those soldier tokens so it seems awesome and then we have Tokasia's Onulet, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four construct at common. When it leaves the battlefield, you gain 2 life, and it also has Unearth for 3 and a white. So 4-4 four, four for 5 mana, maybe a little bit on the kind of a small side, but uh, the Unearth is a nice ability to have on top, and the extra life gain also adds up. Of course, with Unearth, we're guaranteed to gain 2 life. So not a bad card. Don't think it quite gets to the C+. I think the Scrapwork Cohort just has a bit more going for it, but still a playable filler card here. We'll give this a C. And then a Steel Seraph is next, and this is quite the card. It can be a 6 mana 5 4 flyer, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, target creature you control against your choice of flying, vigilance, or lifelink until end of turn. So has an immediate effect the turn you play it, since you can target a different creature, maybe give it flying or lifelink. And then this also has prototype, and the prototype version is one and double white, which will be a 3-3, three, three, so incredibly efficient. Play this on turn three in your white deck, and if the opponent doesn't have removal at the ready, this will quickly take over the game, making it difficult to race with lifelink, and being a flyer itself, it can give another creature flying, so will uh, give your entire team evasion pretty much, making it very difficult to uh, beat it. So the Seraph seems like a bomb level card, doesn't quite have the built-in protection for an S, but uh, definitely one of the better A's so far. And then our final white card is the Combat Thresher, 7 mana, 3-3 three, three artifact creature construct and uncommon, has double strike and when it enters a battlefield you draw a card, but the prototype version is a bit easier to cast here at 3 mana, in which case it's a 1-1, one, one, still has double strike, still draws a card when it enters. So the Comet Thresher does not mess around, definitely a very good uncommon, great synergy with ways to give it additional power, since that pairs nicely with double strike. And this is the type of expensive card you want to be ramping into with your Power Stone tokens, if you get the chance. So easily gets a B. So that concludes all the white cards, including our artifacts. So next up, we're going to take a look at the blue cards. Starting with a weak stones subjugation, single blue for an enchantment aura, enchanting an artifact or creature, and then the enchanted permanent does not untap during its controller's next untap step or any untap step. And when it enters, we can pay three generic mana. If we do tap enchanted permanent, so if the permanent's already tapped, just play it for a blue. If it's not already tapped, then it's essentially 4 mana to keep it at bay. So pretty efficient removal spell, the flexibility is nice, and uh, yeah, seems like a decent blue removal spell. Give it a C+. Now of course it does have the limitations of pacifism effects in general, as we mentioned when talking about the prison sentence. So any way for the opponent to sacrifice their creature or get rid of your enchantment, and the opponent could still get a bit of value uh, at the end of it but 
as far as removal goes in blue, this is not bad. And next is Air Marshal, 2 mana, 2-1 two human soldier at common. And for 3 mana, target a soldier gains a flying until end of turn. So it can also target itself. Even though it's a bit of a pricey ability, it could be a nice way to end the game. If you can keep up the pressure, this is a way to deal with those last points of damage and uh, can kind of turn it into a racing situation. If you dealt some damage early, you're going to be ahead in the race, and then you can afford to maybe spend some mana giving your team flying, and the opponent will uh, not necessarily be able to outrace your flying creatures. So yeah, overall, Marshall, especially in your blue-white soldier aggro deck, could be a fine addition, but uh, not more than a C. Curate is back, now a 2-mana instant, at common, surveil 2, and draws a card. Normally I wouldn't give Curate a particularly high grade, but we do know that there is an archetype, especially blue-black, that cares about enabling cards that need you to draw two cards in the same turn. So that's where Curate kind of fits in. It also could work in the blue-red archetype that just cares about casting non-creature spells. So those are the two main places where I would look to include Curate, but if your deck doesn't have any 2-drops, then this is still maybe a way to spend your mana in a useful manner. So normally I would go with a C for Curate. I think there's enough payoffs that uh, I'm willing to go C plus on Curate, just because there's uh, enough synergy and payoffs for including it. And next is a D, Fabricate, 2 mana instant and uncommon. Choose one, either counter an artifact or enchantment spell, and also exile it. Or we can counter an activated or triggered ability. This is actually pretty decent in this set, where so many of the expensive cards are going to be artifacts. So a 2 mana unconditional counter spell in that regard is uh, pretty decent. Not too difficult to keep up 2 mana either. And maybe your deck has some other instant speed card draw effects like Curate that it can spend its mana on, so it doesn't necessarily go to waste. And then as far as activated or triggered abilities, I believe that means you can counter Unearth with uh, Defabricate, so that could be another relevant interaction, but uh, always be on the lookout for those uh, activated and triggered abilities. So yeah, pretty decent counter spell in this set in particular, so I'm going to go C plus on Defabricate. Then we have the Founder of Latnam, 2 mana, 2-1 two a legendary human artificer, advisor at rare. For 1 and a blue can return target artifact we control to its owner's hand. For 3 mana we can tap it to copy target artifact spell we control. So to copy a spell it needs to be on the stack. So it's kind of tricky to copy an artifact since that's going to require a lot of mana. Let's say you have 6 mana, play a 3 mana artifact then now you can spend your remaining 3 mana to copy it and get a token that's going to be a copy of it. So, you know, copying artifacts is not going to happen until the very late game, but we can also kind of enable that ability with the first one by picking up artifacts we've already played. So ideally, artifacts that have an effect when they enter the battlefield you can think of the scrapwork cohort in white that makes a 1-1 soldier, so that's the type of card you want to combine with Drafna and uh, also means you can potentially chum block with an artifact creature and then pick it back up. So we are allowed to do that, so that's another neat application of this ability. And at the end of the day it's a 2 mana 2-1, two so it can attack and block early if needed. So actually seems like a pretty decent card, C plus for the founder. Then we have the Archaeologist, 2 mana 0-3 oh, human scout at common and this kind of continues the theme of commons that mill 3 when they enter. In this case, we may put a non-creature, non-land card from among the cards milled into our hands, and if we don't, put a plus 1 counter on it. So it could be a 2 mana 1-4, you know, decent blocker early, but uh, not the best when you're trying to apply pressure. Also not a soldier, so doesn't have that going for it. And uh, it's also kind of tricky in this case to get value from the archaeologist, since non-creature, non-land doesn't leave a whole lot of options. We're looking at non-creature artifacts, we're looking at maybe enchantments, instants and sorceries. There's not too many situations where the archaeologist actually will provide you with an extra card, and that's kind of what you're looking for when you put this in your deck, I think. If it's just a 2-mana 1-4 that mills a few cards, it's not that exciting. 
So overall, we'll give the archaeologist a D, but there will be a few decks that are interested in it. Machine over matter, two mana instant at common, saying it costs one less to cast if you control an artifact creature specifically, and then you can return target a non-land permanent to its owner's hand. So pretty cheap bounce spell, especially if you get the discount, and you can bounce both your own as well as the opponent's permanence with it. So yeah, if you're in the market for a bounce spell, this is pretty decent. Give it a C. Scatter Ray is the common counter spell of the set. One on a blue instant and counters target artifact or creature spell unless its controller pays for generic mana. So the opponent could potentially uh, use Power Stone tokens to pay for the four mana. So keep that in mind. But yeah, pay four is a pretty significant cost. So in the early to mid game, this pretty much will counter everything. And if the opponent's trying to cast an expensive artifact in the late game, this could still be useful. So I actually think Scatter Ray is going to be a C plus in this set. Two mana also not incredibly difficult to keep up. Next is Thopter Mechanic, two mana, two one human artificer at uncommon. Says whenever you draw your second card each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on it. And when it dies, create a 1-1 one, one colorless Thopter Artifact Creature token with flying. So yeah, already a 2-1 that when it dies makes a Thopter, I'm sold. And it can randomly pick up additional plus one counters. So it will be at its best in the blue-black draw two archetype. But it doesn't really need much help for it to be good. So C plus for mechanic. A Zephyr Sentinel, two mana, two one human soldier at uncommon, has flash and flying. And when the Sentinel enters a battlefield, return up to one other target creature you control to its owner's hand. And if that creature was a soldier, put a plus one plus one counter on the Sentinel as well. Okay, so this card's not bad. Two mana, two one flyer with flash is already at least a C plus. But this could also save a soldier from removal. Maybe it's underneath kind of a pacifism or the uh, blue counterpart. And then you can uh, pick your creature back up, recast it. And all of a sudden now you get a three powered flyer for two mana. So yeah, this card seems amazing. Good on turn two, but still very good in a late game too. So willing to even give this a B. Then there's Forging the Anchor, 3 mana sorcery at uncommon, letting you look at the top 5 cards of your library, reveal any number of artifact cards from among them and put them into your hand, and the rest on the bottom. Most decks, even the more dedicated artifact synergy decks, are not going to have like 10 plus artifacts necessarily, which is what you would need for Forging the Anchor to even be considered as a, an option. Otherwise, you're just too likely to only find one artifact or disaster scenario you don't find any. So you do need to be heavily committed to artifacts. And yeah, even though there are quite a few artifacts in the sets, there's still plenty of other cards as well. So I'm pretty hesitant to give this a high grade, so we'll go with a D. But there will undoubtedly be some decks where this is good enough. Next is Hercule Master Wizard, 3 mana, 2 for a legendary human wizard advisor at rare. And this one's kind of complicated, so at the beginning of your end step, if you've cast a non-creature spell this turn, okay, so think artifact that's not a creature, maybe enchantments, planeswalker, etc. Then reveal the top 5 cards of your library for each card type among non-creature spells you've cast this turn you may put a card of that same type from among the revealed cards into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Okay, so you need to be casting non-creature spells and ideally your deck needs to have a pretty high density of those same types so you're actually likely to find more cards to actually get ahead. So I think that excludes card types like Planeswalker, probably not too many enchantments either, so that leaves Artifact. And then maybe instant and sorcery, you could also maybe have enough. So I don't think Hercules necessarily going to provide a ton of card advantage. Maybe in kind of a blue-red spells deck where you have lots of instants and sorceries, it could actually work. Um, but on average, I'm not super interested. Uh, of course, still a 3-mana 2-4, which is not the worst. 
but also double blue, so not the easiest to cast on turn three necessarily. So I think it's a playable card, but I could also see cutting it from uh, some blue decks if I just don't have enough synergy for it. And next is Sky Strike Officer. Three mana for a 2-3 human soldier at a rare. It flies, and when it attacks, create a 1-1 colorless soldier artifact creature token, and we can tap three untapped soldiers we control at any point to draw a card, and that also potentially ignores summoning sickness, so we could play the officer, tap two other soldiers and the officer itself to immediately draw a card, which is pretty awesome. And then as soon as we get to untap with the officer and attack, we can make an army of 1-1 tokens that can also turn into additional cards. So the officer kind of does it all, and uh, of course doesn't have any built-in protection necessarily. So if the opponent has removal, they can maybe take it out. But uh, overall, the officer is very impressive, and I think a bomb level A card. Then there's splitting the power stone, 3 mana sorcery at uncommon, as an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice an artifact. That's a very specific requirement, one that's going to be tricky to meet on turn 3, since while you can maybe make some power stones, that usually happens later in the game. The payoff here is that we get to create two tapped power stone tokens, and if the sacrificed artifact happened to be legendary, you also get to draw a card. That's probably not going to happen very often. When I first read Splitting the Power Stone, kind of looking through the Brothers War sets, I wasn't really sold on it. The moment it changed is when I actually started looking at the retro artifact. So for those that don't know, it's a set of 60 plus uh, artifact cards from Manchuk's history that will be included in every single booster, including limited boosters for the Brothers War, and there's going to be one in each pack. And in those retro artifacts, there's actually quite a few cheap artifacts that draw a card when they enter the battlefield. So that's where splitting the power stone could actually work as intended. You just play one of those cheap artifacts, turn one or turn two. Turn three, splitting the power stone, sacrifice the artifact that already drew your card. In the case of Icar Wellspring, as we'll see, you actually get to draw a card when you sacrifice it. And then all of a sudden splitting the power stone actually becomes a powerful option. So, kind of a tricky card to evaluate, but if you build your deck around it, I think it could actually be pretty good. Overall, I can't give it more than a C grade, but uh, just keep your eye out on those retro artifacts especially that may be able to enable it. Next up we have Stern Lesson, 3 mana instant at common. Draw 2 cards and then discard a card, and we also get to create a tapped Power Stone token. So, yeah, this is the type of card we're looking for in blue can enable your blue-black archetype where you want to draw two cards in the same turn, makes a power stone to help you ramp, and even functions as a discard outlet. So in white I mentioned the uh, five mana repair and recharge. So if you have some expensive artifact you can maybe discard it with stern lesson and then turn five repair the uh, artifact from your graveyard and reanimate it basically. So that could be a fun uh, combo as well. So overall, Stern Lesson seems like an important role player for a lot of different blue decks. Gets a C+. Next is the Third Path Savant, a 3 mana 2-3 human wizard, and it's a common for 7 mana as an activated ability. We get to draw 2 cards. So 3 mana 2-3, nothing exciting, but kind of does its job early on, can help you maybe double block, not the best attacker necessarily. But once you get to the late game, especially with the help from Power Stone tokens, that can also help pay for its ability. All of a sudden we get to draw two cards, so that can very quickly get out of hand, and will probably require the opponent to kill your Savant with one of their premium removal spells. Uh, if you can survive the early game, then the Savant starts becoming pretty impressive. So probably at its best in kind of your blue-green ramp archetype, where you've got Power Stones aplenty to activate the ability but also in a more controlling deck that just can play a good late game. This will be pretty good and limited. So overall, still can't really give it more than a C, since getting to 7 mana is going to be the challenge. But once you get there, this is actually not bad. Then we have Urza, Power Stone, a Prodigy. So this is Young Urza, 3 mana, 1-3, Legendary Human Artificer at Uncommon, has Vigilance, 
and for one mana we can tap it to draw a card and then discard a card so we get to loot with urza and whenever we discard one or more artifact cards create a tapped power stone token this ability only triggers once each turn okay so urza is pretty good a looting effect for one mana on a 1-3 Vigilance, so we can even attack with Urza and still potentially loot away some cards and ideally make some Power Stone tokens in the process. So it will help us ramp into our bigger artifacts that we can keep in hand. So yeah, this card definitely offers a ton of utility and I'll give it a C+. Urza's rebuff is next, a 3 mana instant at common, 1 and double blue. And then this is kind of our cancel effect of the set. We get to choose one, either a counter target spell, and this one has a bit of extra upside. We can also choose to tap up to two target creatures instead, which is a useful ability to have on a counter spell because sometimes you get into situations where the opponent is respecting your counter spells, not necessarily casting anything important and just kind of beating you down on the ground and then having a way to maybe tap some creatures down to stem the bleeding, it could be useful. In general, I'm not a fan of 3 mana counter spells in limited since it's difficult to always keep up 3 mana. This set, I think, makes this a bit better, not only because we have some other instants we can play alongside it, like the stern lesson we just discussed as another way to spend our mana if the opponent doesn't play into our counter spell, but this set also just has way more expensive cards than a typical limited set. So if the opponent's casting a 7 or 8 mana artifact, then I'm pretty happy to have a 3 mana answer to those. So I think Urza's rebuff gets a C, whereas normally I would be a bit lower on it. Next is a Wing Commando, 3 mana, 2-2 two, two Human Soldier at common. It flies and it has prowess, so whenever we cast a non-creature spell, this creature gets a plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So nice in your kind of blue-red prowess aggressive decks that are looking to proactively cast non-creature spells. Not the best combo with counter spells, since uh, if you're casting the counter spell on the opponent's turn, the plus one plus one kind of goes to waste, since you want to be beating down. So definitely better in a more proactive uh, deck that is capable of casting its spells in your own turn. And uh, yeah, in that deck, the Wing Commando could be serviceable, but uh, overall not more than a C grade for it. Involuntary cooldown is next, 4 mana sorcery at uncommon, saying tap up to 2 targets, artifacts and or creatures and put 2 stun counters on each of them. So stun counters are back, first seen in Dominaria, so if a permanent with a stun counter on it would become untapped, remove 1 stun counter from it instead. So this can keep some pretty big creatures potentially locked down for several turns. So. This is not the type of card you want to have in your opening hand, but rather a card you want to draw towards the end of the game as a way to get rid of the opponent's largest attackers and blockers and maybe force through lethal damage, or at the very least buy you enough time to deploy your own big finishers. So cooldown can be incredibly impactful if the timing lines up. This is not the type of card I want to have multiple copies of in my deck, and as I've said, not a card you typically want to have in your opening hand, since you would rather kind of develop your own board first. But I can definitely see situations where this will win you the game, since it just bought you just enough time to kind of swing the race in your favor. So I'll give cooldown a C. Not a card I would recommend taking super highly, but as a one-off in a deck, it could definitely make the difference. Next is Latnam Adept, 4 mana, 3-3 three, three human wizard at common, saying whenever you draw your second card each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on the Adept. So another payoff for drawing your second card. The payoff here, while okay, is not necessarily worth it to build your entire deck around. So this is not a card you take early and build around, as opposed to maybe some other cards that we'll see later. So if you're already in the blue-black draw 2 archetype, or you're just a blue deck with a few instant speed card draw effects, then maybe you consider playing the Adept as it can potentially pick up a few extra counters. Also very good with looting effects like Urza, of course, which is also part of why it's so good is that it's an enabler for the draw 2 archetype. So those are the kinds of synergies I'm looking for if I want to include the Adept. So overall, I'm going to give the Adept a D. 
the decks that want access to it should be able to get it. This is the type of card that's probably going to wheel pretty late. But uh, in the decks that have enough enablers, then uh, this will be a solid role player. So yeah, somewhere between a C and a D. But overall, just going to give it a lower grade since I don't think you should prioritize it. And next is Mightstone's animation for mana enchantment aura at common. Enchants an artifact specifically. And when it enters a battlefield, draw a card. And then the enchanted artifact is a creature with base power and toughness 4-4 in addition to its other types. So probably looking to animate one of our power stone tokens, turn it into a 4-4 creature, can attack right away. So that's nice and you get to draw a card. So yeah, in a deck with enough power stone tokens, presumably kind of your blue-green power stone ramp decks, this could be a pretty nice uh, way to animate your power stone into a 4-4 creature. Of course, your deck needs to have a pretty significant uh, amount of artifacts that you can target. Could also be fine with some of those cheaper artifacts that draw a card when they enter the battlefield. And then animation could be a nice 4-mana play as well. So yeah, you do need to build around it a little bit. Not going to be amazing in, let's say, a blue-red spells deck with only a handful of artifacts. But uh, in the right deck, this could be a solid role player. So we'll give it a C. And then there's a Retrieval Agent, 4 mana, 2-5 Human Soldier at common. And for 2 mana, the agent gets plus 1, minus 1 until end of turn. So its power can range from 2-5, but it could potentially get up to 6 power, and then 1 toughness if you sink enough mana into it. Pretty pricey to activate, so don't expect it to necessarily deal 6 very often. But uh, the threat of activation is what kind of matters with cards like this. If you attack this into an opposing 3-3, then they can't really block it unless they're willing to lose their 3-3. So that's a way to sneak in extra points of damage. And then on defense, a 2-5 also not bad. So yeah, the agent's definitely a, a fine filler card, but also not getting more than a C grade here. Next is Take Flight, a 4-mana enchantment aura at Uncommon. Enchanting a creature, giving it plus 1, plus 0, and flying. And then whenever this creature attacks, draw a card. Wow, okay, so ideally you play this when the opponent's tapped out, so you immediately get to enchant a creature, attack, and draw a card. So even if the opponent did have a removal spell, at least it wasn't a complete disaster. And then if the opponent doesn't have an immediate answer, this will quickly run away with the game. I don't typically recommend enchanting your best creature with this, better to kind of spread out the wealth a little bit. But uh, yeah, this card could very quickly run away with the game if the opponent doesn't have an immediate answer at the ready. So I'll give it a B. Just be careful how you use it. Then we have another command. Urza's command is a 4 mana instant at rare. Get to choose two modes between creatures you don't control get minus 2 minus 0 on turn of turn. Can make a tapped power stone token. Or we can make a construct or a construct token which gets plus 1 plus 1 for each artifact you control, including itself. So we could potentially make a power stone and a construct, and then the construct is at the very least a 2-2, but you could of course have plenty of other artifacts pumping it. And the final mode is scry 1 and then draw a card. So a ton of flexibility here on Urza's command, all it's missing is counter target spell. But even without it, this card seems pretty good. The fact that the construct token is untapped when it enters means it can potentially set up an ambush, especially in combination with an extra power stone or shrinking the opponent's creatures down. And of course, you can always choose the mode to scry one and draw a card. So this will always net you card advantage, basically. So can't really go wrong with Urza's command. Gets a B at the very least. Next is a desynchronize 5 mana instant at common, saying target's non land permanence owner puts it on the top or bottom of their library, and we get to scry 2. So, kind of expensive removal, but it does temporarily at least get rid of an opposing permanent, and the scry 2 is nice. So, playable interaction gets a C, just kind of pricey at 5 mana, which is why it's not getting a higher grade. Next is Flow of Knowledge, which is part of the cycle of spells that reward us for sticking to one color. In this case, it's a 5-mana instant and uncommon saying draw a card for each island you control and then discard two cards. So if you're a mono-blue deck, this card seems pretty good. 
five mana, draw five, discard two. That's a deal. But most limited decks are sadly still going to be two colors. And if you're in a two color deck, let's say on turn five, you might have three islands if you're lucky. And then draw three, discard two doesn't look very impressive. Of course, as the game progresses, it will get better and better. Yeah, card draw spells need to be pretty good, especially at five mana to be playable. And I don't think this one will quite make the cut, so I'll give it a D. But in a mono blue deck, this might be one of the best cards. So if you start your draft picking maybe more blue cards than any other color, and you see this towards the middle of the pack, then yeah, maybe you pick it up and kind of focus more on blue cards, and maybe you'll end up mono blue, and this will be a nice payoff. But otherwise, I would avoid it. Next is Keeper of the Cadence, 5 mana, 2 5 human wizard at uncommon and has a 3 mana activated ability, putting a target artifact, instant or sorcery card from a graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. Now, I don't think mill decks are going to be incredibly prevalent in this uh, limited set. There's a few mill artifacts in the uh, set of the retro artifacts, so that's a situation where the Keeper of Cadence can target yourself to make sure you're not going to end up decking and uh, draw from an empty library. Outside of that corner case, this could still be useful against opposing unearthed creatures. Can put those back on the opponent's uh, bottom of their library so they don't get to unearth their creature. So those are the kind of border cases where Keeper could be useful. But 5 mana for a 2-5 is just not really going to cut it, I'm afraid. So Keeper gets a D. Next is Koilos Rock, 5 mana, 3-3 three, three bird at common, has flash and flying. So we've often seen 5 mana, 3-3 three, three flash flyer, but this has additional upside. When it enters the battlefield, create a tapped power stone token. So I'm all about the Koilos Rock, getting that mana boost, especially if you're already at 5 mana, still pretty useful since we're looking to cast 7-8 mana artifacts. So yeah, Koilos Rock gets C+. Also plays well alongside Author Instance that you can keep up, so goes well with your counter spells as well. And then there's another Planeswalker, Teferi Temporal Pilgrim. 5 mana for loyalty, and has a passive saying, whenever you draw a card, put a loyalty counter on Teferi. Okay, and then the 0 ability, which basically turns into a plus 1 ability, lets you draw a card. And then a minus two provides you with a nice win condition. You get a 2-2 two, two blue spirit creature token with vigilance. And whenever you draw a card, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. So Teferi does not mess around. Provides you with a steady stream of win conditions that can play offense and defense. Drawing cards gives more loyalty, gives you more plus one counters. So Teferi kind of does it all. And then the minus 12, if you ever get to it, can also bounce the opponent's entire board back and uh, potentially put a bunch of them on the bottom of their library as well. So yeah, Teferi is an absolute bomb. Don't know if it quite gets to the S tier, since there will be plenty of situations where Teferi is not going to help you when you're behind on board. Maybe the opponent has a bunch of flying creatures, for instance. That's where Teferi is going to be at its worst, since it's not going to be able to protect itself in that case but uh, still definitely a bomb level card. And then the Temporal Anchor is next. Six mana legendary artifact at rare, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, scry two. And whenever you choose to put one or more cards on the bottom of your library while scrying, exile that many cards from the bottom of your library. And then during your turn, you may play cards exiled with the Temporal Anchor. Okay, so it takes a second to parse but essentially turns into beginning of your upkeep, put two cards on the bottom, they get exiled, and now I can play those two cards. And it's not until end of turn, it's as long as we control the temporal anchor. So the only way we really get punished for exiling everything is the opponent finding an answer to the temporal anchor itself, which could happen, so that's a reason to st sometimes still play it safe. But uh, yeah, we can even play a lands out of exile. So this almost turns into draw two extra cards each turn. And then the cherry on top is that it's an artifact, so we can actually use Power Stone tokens to potentially cast this ahead of schedule. Now, I guess being an artifact is potentially also its downfall, since people will be packing main deck artifact hate. So this will potentially be answered by the opponent at some point, but hopefully not before it provided a bit of card advantage. 
So yeah, the Temporal Anchor is another bomb level card that will quickly take over the game if it goes unopposed, and uh, seems like a lot of fun to play with. Next is Hercules Final Meditation, a 7 mana instant at rare, and as long as it's not your turn, this spell costs 3 generic more to cast, so it costs 10 mana if we want to play it during the opponent's turn. And uh, let's see here if it's worth it. Return all non-land permanents to their owner's hands. So it's symmetrical, it also bounces our permanents back. And then end the turn. So you can see now why it's more expensive to play during the opponent's turn. You could cast this during the opponent's upkeep, even prevent them from drawing a card by ending the turn as well as bouncing all their stuff back. But the problem with this card is that it also bounces your stuff back, so I don't really see how you're gonna leverage this in a game of limited. Bounce everything, sure you're the first one to potentially be able to untap and play your stuff out, but then the opponent's simply gonna replay everything you've bounced, and if you're getting into the point in the game where you have 7 or 10 mana to cast Meditation, the opponent's also very likely to be able to replay everything. So I'm not really seeing how you really get ahead with Meditation. The fact that it's an instant means you cannot really use your Power Stones to cast this either. So yeah, I'm not really sold on this. There may be some corner cases where this is the best card out there, but uh, I'm failing to see it. So we'll go with a D. And next is one with the Multiverse 8 mana, Enchantment at Mythic. And this one delivers. You may look at the top card of your library at any time and play a lands and cast spells from the top of your library. So a nice future sight effect. And once during each of your turns, you may cast a spell from your hand or the top of your library without paying its mana cost. So kind of an omniscience-like ability. And yeah, the payoff is certainly there. Problem is getting to 8 mana in the first place. Once again, we cannot use our power stones to ramp out or enchantment so maybe we can try and discard it and bring it back with the uh, five mana repair and recharge once again or we can just hope to get to eight mana eventually and then this will definitely take over the game by providing a ton of extra card advantage the greedy part in me wants to play this in every blue deck every chance i get pretty much the more rational part of my brain is saying 8 mana is still kind of expensive, especially when power stones don't work. So I can't go too crazy on this card, but I'm still going to settle on a C+. I think the format might be slow enough where getting to 8 mana is still feasible, and then this should win you the game if you get to it. So I'm going to go with C+, overall. Next we get to the artifacts in blue. Starting with Combat Courier, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one Construct at common. For 2 mana we can sacrifice it to draw a card. And it also has Unearth for a single blue. So the Courier is better before we unearth it, because we can potentially chump block a big creature from the opponent, still pay the 2, sacrifice it, draw a card, and essentially soak up some damage. Doesn't really work with Unearth, since we can only unearth as a sorcery during our turn. And of course we won't be able to block that way but it still potentially provides us with a cheap way to maybe sacrifice an artifact. Let's say we're playing with the uh, three mana splitting the power stone, which requires us to have a, an artifact to sacrifice. Then maybe combat courier is worth it, especially for unearthing it. So those are the types of synergies I'm looking for with combat courier. And uh, maybe we can enchant it with the uh, four mana mightstone animation, for instance and then we can turn it into a 4-4 creature instead. So by itself, not particularly good since it's just too expensive to actually draw cards with it. If you're looking to unearth it and then still pay two mana to sacrifice and draw, then you're already spending three mana total just for one card. So yeah, kind of slow, but definitely has a few maybe fancy synergies going in its favor. So overall, I'm gonna land on a C for Combat Courier. We'll keep the alliteration flowing here. Just uh, be sure that you have enough kind of synergies to go with it, because individually it's not particularly impressive. Next is Surge Engine, and this one doesn't really need any help. A 2-mana 3-2 artifact creature construct at Mythic has Defender, but won't have Defender for long. Single blue to get rid of it, and then this creature cannot be blocked. So this is kind of reminiscent of Evolved Sleeper from Dominaria, 
which will get better the more mana we sink into it. So once we pay the blue, it's a 3-2 that cannot be blocked, so it turns into a real win condition. Then if we pay another 2 and a blue, it turns into a 5-4, still unblockable, so only takes a few attacks to kill the opponent. And then if we ever get to 6 mana, we can draw 3, can activate this once. So yeah, the Surge Engine is definitely a bomb level card. It is definitely answerable, it's not like it has any built-in protection, but will also play nicely alongside some blue counter spells as you can maybe keep up your mana and counter if needed, if not level up your Surge Engine and take over the game. Then there's Arcane Proxy, 7 mana, Artifact Creature Wizard at Mythic. It's a 4-3, but it also has Prototype, in which case it's 1 and double blue for a 2-1. And then when it enters a battlefield, if you cast it, you may exile an instant or sorcery card with mana value less than or equal to the proxy's power from our graveyard. Copy that card, and we may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So, kind of an artifact sorcery speed version of Snapcaster Mage. And uh, yeah, this could be pretty decent if you built your deck around it. So let's say we're casting the proxy with prototype, then we're looking to flashback maybe a 1 or a 2 mana, uh, instant or sorcery. There's not too many of those in the set, maybe you happen to pick up a curate. Not the best with counter spells, since you're not going to be able to counter anything with it. So yeah, the 3 mana version is going to be kind of hit or miss whether or not you can actually enable it. Once we get to the 4 mana version, it kind of opens up more potential instants and sorceries to get back. Can uh, maybe get back some more expensive card draw spells, and then uh, the proxy turns into a more interesting card. So overall for limited, good, probably not quite bomb level, so I'm gonna land on B for arcane proxy. Just make sure you have enough ways to enable it, and uh, probably gonna be at its best in kind of your blue-red spells deck, is my guess. Next is Teresian Mindbreaker, 7 mana, 6 4, artifact Juggernaut at rare, saying when it attacks, defending player mills half their library rounded up. So, by itself, it's gonna take quite a while to actually mill the opponent out completely. Two attacks gets you pretty close, but then you'll still need to survive a few turns. And uh, 7 mana for 6 4, not necessarily the best rate, but we can also unearth it for 1 and triple blue and then get one maybe final attack in to mill the opponent for a bunch. Overall, not super high on Mindbreaker. Um, maybe if your deck is really a focused mill deck, and as we'll see with a retro artifact, there are a few additional mill cards out there, then I could see the Mindbreaker being kind of the final piece of the puzzle. In your average limited decks, I don't think this is gonna win you the game by milling very often, so I'll give it a D. Then we have Spotter Thopter, 8 mana, 4, 5, uncommon with flying, and when it enters a battlefield, scry X, where X is its power. So if we actually cast this for 8 mana, scry 4 is incredibly useful, as we can bottom any additional lands. And we can also prototype it for 4 mana, in which case it's a 2, 3. So 2, 3, flyer for 4 mana, not necessarily the best rate, but we still also get to scry 2 in that case, which is still a pretty nice bonus. So overall, Spotter Thopter offers a ton of flexibility and gets a C+. And then there's a Depth Charge Colossus, 9 mana for a 9-9 nine, nine Dreadnought artifact creature, and it does not untap during your untap step. So gonna be at its best when uh, playing defense until you get to the point where you have the mana to spend on it to actually start attacking, because for 3 mana we can untap the Depth Charge Colossus. And then it can also be prototyped, although it's still pretty pricey. If we do, it's, it's still going to be 6 mana for a 6-6. Six, six. So Colossus, not actually all that bad if you're just planning to play defense with it. Once you start attacking, you need to make sure you have the mana available to keep untapping it. Another advantage, I guess, of the untap ability is that it's going to be able to dodge some removal spells like the weak stones subjugation which tries to keep it tapped down now we can just spend three mana to untap it so that kind of gets around it i suppose if the opponent tries to put stun counters on it you can also pay three mana to remove a stun counter essentially so 
untapping it has a few corner case advantages, but of course for the most part going to be a drawback. But uh, yeah, in a controlling blue deck that just needs an expensive finisher, this could fit the bill. So overall we'll give it a C. Not a card every blue deck wants. I don't think like a blue-red spells deck necessarily wants it, but uh, a more controlling blue deck could certainly want this as a finisher. And you can also, if you have all the mana for it, potentially attack with it and then untap during the opponent's turn to kind of get pseudo-vigilance, maybe ambush an attacker. So that's also nice. Next is the Hulking Metamorph, 9 mana for a 7-7 Shapeshifter at Uncommon. And it can also be prototyped for 4 mana, in which case it's a 3-3. And when it enters the battlefield, you enter as a copy of an artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact creature in addition to its other types, and base power and toughness equal to the Metamorph's power and toughness. So it's not going to change from a 3-3 or a 7-7. But, of course, we can maybe copy some useful abilities on other artifacts or creatures. You know, we'll have to look for kind of some synergies with the Metamorph for it to be at its best. But uh, it's not going to be too difficult since there's plenty of interesting artifacts and uh, creatures in this set we could copy. Metamorph gets a C+. It's not going to be too difficult to get value out of it. Our first black card is Ashnod Flesh. Mechanist, a 1 mana, 1-1 one, one, legendary human artificer, at rare, has death touch, and when Ashnod attacks, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, create a tapped power stone token. Alright, we're all about power stones here. Of course, sacrificing a creature, pretty big cost, but there are a few cards in black that can make random 1-1 one, one creatures you don't mind sacrificing, so that's kind of the synergy you're looking for. And for 5 mana, we can exile a creature card, from our graveyard and create a tapped 3-3 colorless zombie artifact creature token. So not a bad mana sink and we can potentially use our power stones to help pay for the 5 mana ability which is also useful. So yeah, Ashnod's not bad, a 1 mana 1-1 one, one death touch, typically always a playable limited card and this offers a ton of extra upside. So Ashnod gets a B. Perfect for your black green graveyard matters deck especially. Next is Ashnod's Intervention, single black for an instant at common, saying until end of turn, target creature gets plus 2 plus 0 and gains when this creature dies or is put into exile from the battlefield to return it to its owner's hand. So we've often seen these types of effects in Limited before, sometimes they return the creature to the battlefield, in this case it's back to our hand, still a nice way to maybe trade up for a larger creature from the opponent without losing our creature in the process. So Intervention's not a bad trick, um, but again, as far as combo tricks go, I'm not going to prioritize them during the draft. Should be able to get them pretty late, so we'll go with C for Intervention. Next is Disfigure, a reprint, 1 mana, instant speed, common, give a creature minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. So not a bad removal spell if you're in the market for a cheap, efficient removal spell. The upside here is that it can also shrink an opposing creature down in the middle of combat, so you can still maybe block it and uh, take it out or shrink down a blocking creature. So there's definitely advantages to the minus two, minus two. And uh, yeah, this figure's always been a very efficient removal spell. Happy giving it a C plus. Don't think I'm cutting it from almost any black deck. Then we've got Dreams of Steel and Oil, single black sorcery at uncommon, saying target opponent reveals their hand, you choose an artifact or creature card from it, and then choose an artifact or creature card from their graveyard as well, and exile the chosen card. So exiling something from a graveyard is additional upside, especially in the case of Unearth. Getting rid of a creature can be quite useful. And then artifacts and creatures are the most important card types in Limited, especially for this set. So I'm usually not a huge fan of these one mana discard spells in Limited, since they tend to kind of be low impact, you can draw them late game and they don't do anything. This one has a little bit of upside, the graveyard part of it is nice with Unearth, but it also is a format that kind of lends itself to more expensive creatures, so the opponent is more likely to still have an expensive card in their hand that they're looking to cast in the late game, so Dreams of Steel and Oil is less likely to be a dead card, so I think that bumps it up to playable range, and we'll give it a C. 
Then there's annoying a vermin 1 mana for a 1 1 rat at uncommon. And when it enters the battlefield, target player mills two cards. So you can maybe mill yourself to enable some synergies. And then when the vermin dies, target creature you don't control gets minus one minus one until end of turn. Okay, so you can maybe take out a two toughness creature if it attacks into it. So as far as a one drop goes, it's not bad if you're looking to play defense. Uh, on offense, it's not the best card since the opponent can just take one or uh, of course block it if they don't have anything that dies to it. And then the mill two part may or may not be relevant depending on your deck. So yeah, not incredibly excited by the vermin, but I could see some decks wanting it if you can make good use of the uh, mill two especially, but I'll go with a D overall. Next is Diabolic Intent, another reprint and potentially an exciting one for Constructed as well. Two mana sorcery at rare, as an additional cost to cast it, we have to sacrifice a creature, but then once that's done, we get to search our library for any card and put it into our hand. So kind of a tutor effect. Problem is sacrificing a creature. So in limited, where we have a harder time playing cheap sacrifice fodder, this is going to be a bit more difficult to enable. And then for a tutor to be worth it, we also need some bomb level cards that are worthy of being searched up in the first place. If you're just going to search up a removal spell, then it's not all that exciting. Can be playable, especially in the right deck where you have enough creatures you're happy to sacrifice. But uh, I wouldn't overrate it, so fall somewhere in the C range. Some decks may not even want it. Next is Emergency Weld, 2 mana sorcery at common, returns an artifact or creature card from your graveyard to your hand, and create a 1-1 colorless soldier artifact creature token. So I think the best way to look at Emergency Weld is as kind of a mini 2 mana gravedigger. So it makes a 1-1 creature and returns a creature from your graveyard to your hand. And if you look at it that way, it's actually a pretty good card. The 1-1 may seem kind of irrelevant but there's a ton of ways to make use of it as we've already seen plenty of ways to sacrifice it for value and then uh, you still get to bring back a creature from the graveyard so gonna be great in kind of a black green graveyard deck good in your uh, black red sacrifice decks where you can maybe also sacrifice the one one for value but i think almost every black deck is going to be happy to have pretty much as many of these as uh, you can draft of course there is a limit when uh, you need enough creatures to actually bring back in the first place, but I don't think that's going to be a major problem. So Weld gets a C+, one of the more exciting commons, I think, in black. Then there's the Gixian Infiltrator, 2 mana, 2-1 two Fraxian Human at common. When you sacrifice another permanent, put a plus one plus one counter on it. There is a little bit of sacrifice synergy, of course, in black. A red-black sacrifice is an archetype. And just in black by itself, there's plenty of cards that let you sacrifice. Some artifacts as well that may be able to be sacrificed. Also looking at the retro artifacts, there's a few that come to mind. So yeah, the Infiltrator I think is still just a C uh, role player. But uh, in the right deck, this could actually turn into one of your better two drops. And then we've got another exciting reprint. Go for the Throat, two mana instant at uncommon, destroying an non-artifact creature. So we've often seen these two mana black removal spells that seem incredibly powerful, but then you of course factor in the actual limited sets they're printed in, and in this case plenty of powerful artifact creatures that this won't be able to kill necessarily. So that does make it less exciting than it would be normally, but I think there's enough non artifact creatures out there that you're happy to kill, especially for a very efficient rate, that this is still a B-level card. Then there's Misery's Shadow, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Shade at rare, and Shades in Magic typically have the ability to pay a black, this creature gets plus one plus one until end of turn. In this case, instead of paying a black, it's just pay one mana. So that's a very significant upgrade, because now in a two-color deck you can still get the most out of your shade. And this has an additional ability that's also quite relevant in this set. If a creature the opponent controls would die, exile it instead. 
So Misery's Shadow is amazing, can play it early, Threat of Activation is always there, so we'll often attack for two unopposed in the early game, and then once you get to the late game, when you actually don't have anything else to cast, just sink all your mana into it, and deal massive amounts of damage. So, easy card to underrate, and I think it's actually a, a bomb level card, we'll give it an A. And next is Power Stone Fracture, 2 mana, sorcery at common, as an additional cost to cast, sacrifice an artifact or creature, and then destroy target creature or planeswalker. So this is our bone splinters of the set, so another card that requires us to have some cheap cards to uh, sacrifice, so another reason to like cards like the emergency weld making a 1-1 token. And yeah, best case scenario, you play this in the red-black sacrifice deck, there's a 4 mana Act of Treason-like ability that can steal an opposing creature for a turn, and then you can Fracture to sacrifice it and kill another creature, so that combo is once again in a limited, but of course you can also sacrifice Power Stone tokens to it, so keep that in mind. So yeah, solid role player. there's still a few hoops to jump through if you want to make this work, so not quite as good as some other removal spells out there, but uh, still a C+. Next is Thrain Vigil, 2 mana enchantment at uncommon, saying whenever one or more artifacts and or creature cards leave your graveyard during your turn, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. So there's a few ways to interpret this. Um, this works well with unearth creatures that will leave the graveyard and then you get a plus one counter. This works well with Graveyard Recursion in black and black-white especially, there's a lot of those. So there is definitely enough synergy out there to make Vigil a work. Question is, is it worth including in your deck? You're still playing a card to maybe get a handful of counters, so you really need to go all in on these synergies to make it worthwhile. And I don't think the average deck is really gonna be able to make this work. So I'm gonna give this a D, but yeah, under the right circumstances I could see this being pretty decent. Next is Thraxo Demon, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Demon at common, and for 3 mana can tap, sacrifice another creature or artifact to draw a card. Yeah, I like 2 mana 2-2s two that have late game utility, and this fits that description, can just be a nice early play, and then once you get to the late game you can uh, sacrifice some cards you don't need to turn into extra card advantage. So, fine card. Don't think I'm quite willing to go C plus on this since it is kind of pricey to activate, but C for Thraxo Demon. Then there's a Battlefield Butcher, 3 mana, 1 for Human Soldier at Uncommon, and has a 5 mana tap ability, saying each opponent loses 2 life, but also gets a 1 mana discount for each creature card in your graveyard. So, especially in the black-green Graveyard Matters deck, it's not going to be too difficult to fill your graveyard, and then you could potentially activate this for free if you have five or more creatures in your graveyard, which is potentially realistic. And then a 1-4 that taps to drain the opponent for two each turn is pretty good. It can block to soak up some damage, and then essentially deal two unblockable damage each turn, which certainly adds up, so it turns into a legitimate win condition. So yeah, I'm happy giving this C+. Next is Carrion Locust, 3 mana, 2 one insect horror at common, it flies, and when the Locust enters the battlefield, exile target card from an opponent's graveyard, and if it was a creature card, that player loses one life. So 2-1 flyer for 3, a little bit overcosted. The times of 3 mana 2-2 two, two flyers being good and limited I think has passed, they need a bit more to be worth it. And yeah, this one offers a little bit of extra utility, exiling a card, again good against Unearth, but I feel like we've seen more hate cards for Unearth as opposed to actual cards with Unearth, so I might be overselling that aspect of it. But of course plenty of creatures that will naturally end up in the graveyard, and this will drain the opponent for one. So playable filler card, but I'm not gonna go over a C. 
Then we have the Gixian Skull Flare, 3 mana, 2, 3, Phyrexian, Human Assassin at common, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, if there are three or more creature cards in your graveyard, put a plus one plus one counter on the Skull Flare. So if you play this on turn three, very unlikely to start picking up plus one counters, but as the game progresses, especially if you have a few self mill effects, then the Skull Flare can start growing. But of course, by the time you enable the Skull Flare, a 2-3 that picks up a plus one counter each turn may not really be all that impactful anymore, but still has potential. And especially if you jump through the hoops of uh, self mill and enabling the Skull Flare, it could be one of your better three drops, but we'll go with C. Then there's a Gixus Caress, three mana sorcery at common. Target opponent reveals their hand, you choose a non-land card from it, and that player discards that card, and you also get to create a tapped Power Stone token. So that uh, second line of text of making a Power Stone token makes this into a much more powerful effect, of course. And I can repeat what I've said when talking about the one mana discard effect. Discard should be a little bit better in this limited format than normal because of all the expensive artifacts out there. And uh, this also helps you ramp. The Power Stone can maybe be sacrificed to various effects. So there's plenty of utility with the uh, extra Power Stone. So I'll give this a C plus. And then we have a Gix himself, the Yogmoth Praetor, 3 mana, 3-3 three, three, Legendary Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic, saying whenever a creature deals comma damage to one of your opponents, its controller may pay one life, and if they do, they draw a card. The wording is a little confusing because it's probably meant for multiplayer, but uh, for most intents and purposes, it's kind of a coastal piracy effect. So if you hit the opponent, you get to draw cards. Although since we're in black, we're going to have to pay one life for each card we draw. And then there's more, seven mana ability. We can discard X cards to exile the top X cards of target opponent's library. And we may play lands and cast spells from among those cards without paying their mana costs. So it could be a fun way to maybe end the game. Uh, yeah, Gix seems pretty decent if you have enough ways to keep getting in for damage. So going to be at its best with cheap evasive creatures that have an easier time attacking between a, a B plus A territory. So I guess we'll just give it an A, bomb level card. And uh, yeah, ideally you can get on the board quickly to start drawing those extra cards. So that's where you want to look for additional one and two drops. Then there's the gruesome realization, three mana sorcery at uncommon, letting you choose one between you draw two cards and lose two life or creatures your opponents control get minus one, minus one until end of turn. Okay, so there's a bit of flexibility here. The minus one, minus one, especially brutal against some of the soldier tribal decks out there. And then draw two, lose two. You know, still a nice two for one, even though it costs a bit of life. We're used to seeing those in black. This one doesn't really offer any additional card selection necessarily, but it's also a way to enable some of your draw two cards per turn synergies that we've seen in blue black. Don't think there's gonna be quite as many tokens running around but I may be wrong there. So yeah, I'm kind of between a C and a C plus for realization. I think it's playable, but I could also see some black decks not even playing this if they have better things to do with their mana. So we'll go with a C for realization. Then there's Gurgling Anointer, three mana, one three Phyrexian Horror at Uncommon. It flies and says whenever you draw your second card each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on it. So yet another payoff. And then when it dies, return another target creature card with mana value less than or equal to the anointer's power from your graveyard to the battlefield. Okay, so this is definitely a nice uh, payoff for drawing your second card each turn. So if you have an anointer, then all those card draw effects, of course, go up in value. And uh, yeah, a flyer that can pick up some plus one counters is always nice. And this is cheap enough where you should be able to deploy it in a timely manner and gets some nice upside out of it. I think you'll still be able to get enough advantage out of it that I'm going with C plus for anointer. If your deck doesn't have any additional card draw, then of course feel free to cut it. Next is the kill zone acrobat, three mana, three two human soldier at common. And when the acrobat attacks, you may sacrifice another creature or artifact. If you do, the acrobat gains flying until end of turn. 
So in a hyper aggressive deck, maybe this is okay. Uh, I guess the best synergy that we'll see is if you pick up the Act of Treason effect at 4 mana in red, then you could steal an opposing creature and actually already kill it on turn 4 basically, um, which is not all that easy to accomplish since other sacrifice effects often cost additional mana. So that's the main synergy you're looking to kind of assemble. So outside of that very specific scenario in red-black, I don't think the Acrobat's quite worth it, since a 3 2 for 3 is kind of below the curve these days, and it's not like you can keep really sacrificing things to the Acrobat to give it flying. So yeah, you're going to run out of stuff to sacrifice eventually. So I'll go with a D for Acrobat, but uh, especially in red-black, this may go up in value. Then there's a moment of defiance, a three mana instant at common. Target creature gets plus two, plus one, and gains a lifelink until end of turn. And we also get to draw a card. So pretty strange combination of words, but uh, yeah, I think overall this is a playable effect. We'll probably not be able to save our creature with only one extra toughness, but plus two, plus one should at least be able to trade up for a larger creature. Then lifelink means we can pad our life total a little bit and we manage to draw a card. So we're not necessarily down on cards in the exchange. So playable effects. Do I want to fill my deck with Moment of Defiance? No. But if I have one or two, I should be able to make good use of it. Especially if I also have some first strike creatures in my deck, then it becomes much, much better. Um, so we'll go with C for Moment of Defiance. Then there's Fateful Handoff, 4 mana, sorcery at rare, saying draw cards equal to the mana value of target artifact or creature you control, and then an opponent gains control of that permanent. The dream scenario, I guess, is you unearth a creature, attack with it, or even don't attack with it, doesn't matter, and then you Fateful Handoff, draw a bunch of cards, the opponent gets your unearth creature and it goes away end of turn. Or, I guess another scenario, opponent has the uh, pacifism effect of the sets, either in white being the prison sentence, or in blue, weak stones subjugation. So your creature is basically useless, and with Fateful Handoff you at least get to draw a few cards off of it, and then give it to the opponent, which won't be able to use it either. So those are the rare circumstances where Handoff could be playable. In most other circumstances I don't think it will be very good. So I see this as a very narrow sideboard card, but not a card I'm looking to main deck in your average limited deck. So I'll give it a D. Next is a Gixian Puppeteer, 4 mana, 4, 3, Fraxian, a Warlock, and Rare, saying whenever you draw your second card each turn, each opponent loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. It's another nice upside here. And then when the Puppeteer dies, return another target creature card with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Okay, so not bad for a 4-drop, offers quite a bit of extra value, and shouldn't be too difficult to enable the second ability by having something in the graveyard. And then, yeah, of course going to be at its best in blue-black, where you have the most card draw to drain the opponent for 2. So even if the Puppeteer isn't attacking, it's uh, still potentially going to help you win the game. Don't think it's quite a bomb level card, but at the very least a B for Puppeteer. Next is Hostile Negotiations, a 4 mana instant at rare. This one's also kind of complicated. Exile the top 3 cards of your library in a face down pile. Okay, then exile the top 3 cards of your library in another face down pile. Okay, so we've got two face down piles of 3 cards. Then we can look at the cards in each pile, and then turn one of those piles of your choice face up. So now there's one face down three card pile and one face up three card pile. And then an opponent chooses one of these piles, put that pile into your hand and the author into your graveyard, and you lose three life. Okay, so kind of have to play mind games with the opponent. Maybe you reveal your best pile, hoping the opponent thinks the face down pile is even better. Sometimes you just kind of have to hope to get lucky. So either way, you are sort of giving the opponent extra information. So I think this is probably just worse than 4 mana draw 3, lose 3 life. 
but there are a few additional graveyard synergies potentially to make this a little bit better. Also awkward is that it's not actually card draw. So if you're playing the blue-black draw two synergy deck, this doesn't actually draw extra cards. So overall kind of a, an awkward mess of a card, but could lead to some fun mini games. Probably still a C plus. I'm probably gonna play the most black decks, but uh, could also lead to some field bad moments where uh, your best cards are gonna end up in your graveyard. Although, hopefully you still have ways to get them back, I guess. Next is Ravenous, a Giga Mole, a 4 mana, 2 3 Mole Horror in black, and uh, at Common Rather, saying when the Giga Mole enters the battlefield, mill 3 cards, so that continues our cycle of commons that mill 3. In this case, you may put a creature card from among the cards milled this way into your hand. If you don't, put a plus 1 counter on it. So either a 4 mana 3 4, which is, you know, fine but not exciting, or a 4 mana 2 3 that essentially draws a creature, which sounds a bit better. So will be at its best in the black green graveyard synergy deck. And of course, ideally, played it in a deck with a pretty high creature density, so you're more likely to mill a creature and put it into your hand. So yeah, Giga Mole seems playable. We'll give it a C. Then we have a Gixus Command, another one of these rare commands. This uh, five mana sorcery, choose two modes, can put two plus one plus one counters on up to one creature against a lifelink until end of turn. Okay, not bad. Second mode, destroy each creature with power two or less. So kind of a sweeper effect. Then the third mode, return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hands. So a nice two for one. So that's one of the more exciting modes so far. And then last but not least, each opponent sacrifices a creature with the highest power among creatures they control. Okay, so the last two modes are probably the ones I'm gonna look for the most as it's just a clean three for one. Opponent loses their biggest creature. We get two creatures back from the graveyard. So a nice uh, three for one, sign me up. And uh, of course has a ton of extra utility. So. Gixus Command, I think, uh, nears bomb territory. While it doesn't necessarily win the game by itself, it kind of wins the game by itself, if you know what I'm saying. Then No One Left Behind is a 5 mana sorcery at Uncommon. Says this spell costs 3 less to cast if it targets a creature with mana value 3 or less. So then it just costs 2 mana. And then return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So another reanimation effect. We're used to seeing these at 5 mana. This one has a bit of extra utility if you're trying to get back something small. So maybe okay in your black-white um, kind of mana value 3 or less decks. Although at that point there's probably a better variant with recommission, which will also give it a plus 1 counter. So yeah, not sure where uh, you're really looking to use this. Maybe you've got other discard outlets and then you can reanimate something big for 5 mana. Of course, plays well with the prototype creatures. So, yeah, overall, give this a C. Good, but needs a bit of build around to be worth it. Don't think your average black deck really wants this. Overwhelming Remorse, 5 mana instant at common. Costs 1 less to cast for each creature card in your graveyard. And then we can exile target creature or planeswalker. Exiling is big, means no unearth shenanigans, no other ways to bring creatures back. And uh, even if we have to pay 5 mana for this, it's not the end of the world and could easily become cheaper up to potentially just a single black. So this seems like kind of the best common black card uh, in the set, just one of those unconditional removal spells, and those typically get a B. Next is Painful Quandary. 5 mana enchantments at rare, says whenever an opponent casts a spell, that player loses 5 life unless they discard a card. Okay, so typically these punisher mechanics that give the opponent a choice aren't particularly great, because whenever you're giving the opponent agency, they can make the decision that's best for them, so you're not necessarily getting the most out of it. Although this one hits pretty hard, and of course at some point the opponent's going to be empty-handed, they can potentially sandbag some lands, but in a format that's looking to cast expensive creatures, the opponent's potentially more incentivized to uh, play out all their lands. So that also makes this a little bit better. 
and then if the opponent doesn't have anything left to discard it's going to be five life over and over and it doesn't take much to kill the opponent so yeah quandary seems pretty decent actually um it doesn't help you if you're behind on board if the opponent already has an army they can just no longer cast spells and still kill you so you do need to play it in a deck with enough early defense or removal but uh, assuming you can meet those conditions this could actually be a pretty legit win condition so i'll give quandary a b then there's trench stalker five mana four five beast horror at common says as long as you've drawn two or more cards this turn trench stalker has a death touch and lifelink so yeah not a bad payoff for draw two but it is five mana of course the fact that we can potentially enable this at instant speed is nice so let's say you attack this into the opponent's let's say bigger creature then there's also kind of the threat of an instant speed card draw effect to give this death touch uh, which the opponent may be afraid of so i guess it has that going for it too and if you have a draw two you can potentially enable this in the opponent's turn as well so yeah going to be at its best in blue black outside of it's probably not very good so i'll start with uh, relatively low grade we'll just give it a c but uh, i can definitely see this doing some work in the right deck then there's corrupt this is part of that cycle of cards that care about having lots of basics of one color and this is a reprint as well six mana sorcery at uncommon dealing damage to any targets equal to the number of swamps you control and you gain life equal to the damage dealt this way so this can even target the opponent directly and uh, yeah six mana is kind of pricey i don't think you can really play corrupt in a two color deck and be happy with it if you're only dealing three damage it's not that great so this is really a card that wants you to be mono black in mono black specifically this is usually a pretty powerful effect you maybe picked up three or four black cards maybe one or two cards in a different color and then you see a corrupt in the pack then it's maybe the time to take it and speculate on going mono black so again not a high pick but if i see it and the opportunity presents itself to go mono black then i'll give it a try so c for corrupt then there's a disciples of gix six mana fraxian human at uncommon is a four four and when it enters a battlefield search your library for up to three artifact cards and put them into your graveyard okay so disciples i guess wants to synergize with maybe artifact creatures that have an earth um there may be some other graveyard synergies maybe you just have lots of um kind of raised dead effects to bring back creatures from your graveyard to your hand and then the disciples can bring back some powerful artifact creatures as well and then in the black green archetype that cares about having lots of creatures in graveyard this could also be a useful enabler it's a six mana four four which is a little bit pricey but uh, could set up some interesting synergies so i think c plus for disciples i think most black decks will be able to make good use of it and then we get to the black artifact cards and uh, I say black artifacts, of course, you could technically play these in any author deck since you don't need black mana to cast them. But as with most of the other cards we've seen so far, the various artifacts, I don't think you're going to play, let's say, a clay revenant if you don't have black mana. So for most intents and purposes, you can consider these as their respective colors. So clay revenant, one mana, one, two, artifact creature golem at common, and it enters battlefield tapped and for two and a black we can return it from our graveyard to our hand so this reminds me of sanitarium skeleton which was basically the same except cost one black mana and it did not enter the battlefield tapped which is a significant difference because at least with a skeleton you could bring it back play it chum block rinse repeat with the revenants you can only really chum block every other turn so that makes it significantly worse but it still potentially helps you enable those sacrifice synergies if you need a cheap artifact or creature to sacrifice this will do and you can keep bringing it back and then especially in the late game you can set up some interesting loops with it so it is a card that uh, by itself is not that great but with enough synergy 
uh, becomes uh, potentially a pretty important engine card. So I think that puts it in the D category, whereas Skeleton was good at any black deck, the Revenant really needs some very specific synergies, so you should be able to get this pretty late, and uh, you don't need to prioritize it during the draft. And next is Ashnod's Harvester, 2 mana, 3 1 construct and uncommon. And when it attacks, exile target card from a graveyard, and it also has unearth for 1 and a black. So an aggressive 2 drop can get in some nice points of damage early, and then potents incentivized to trade for it since they can't really keep taking 3 over and over. And then you can still unearth one last time to exile a card and get potentially 3 more damage in. So yeah, Harvester's not bad, C. Plus. Then we have a Dredging Claw, 2 mana equipment at common, giving the equipped creature plus 1 plus 2 and a menace, equipping for 1 and a black, but whenever a creature enters a battlefield from our graveyard, we may attach a Dredging Claw to it. So we've seen a couple unearthed creatures that this could synergize with, a few other effects that bring back a creature from the graveyard, but overall I don't think I'm quite sold on Dredging Claw. Menace is nice, one extra power, not super impactful, but we're probably just having to pay a bit too much for this effect, two to play, two to equip in most circumstances. Um, yeah, I think this is a D, but I could see some very focused graveyard recursion decks where you can consistently equip this for free, where it could actually be worth it. And then there's the Razor Lash, Transmigrants, I'm gonna say. 2 mana, 3 1 artifact creature zombie at rare. Cannot block, so we've often seen these. 2 mana creatures that cannot block, which often means they come back from the graveyard, and it's no different here. 6 mana to return the transmigrant from our graveyard to the battlefield, but it also gets a plus 1 plus 1 counter. And then this ability costs 4 generic less to activate if an opponent controls 4 or more non basic lands. So in limited, that's probably not going to come up, but it is useful for constructed, where you're more likely to activate this for just two mana to bring it back, which is a pretty interesting way to balance kind of your limited and constructed cards. But uh, as far as limited is concerned, a 3-1 that cannot block, only really great in a very aggressive deck that can consistently be the beat down. If you're on the defensive, this is not going to help, unless you just need something to sacrifice to an effect maybe. And then once you get to the late game, six mana is kind of pricey, but it is a recursive threat. And once it gets back with a plus one counter as a four two, it's uh, more likely to have good attacks and force some awkward trades. So overall, not a bad card. We'll give it a C plus. Then there's the Transmigrant's Crown, two mana equipment at rare, giving plus two plus O. Oh. And whenever the equipped creature dies, you draw a card and then can equip for 2 mana or a single black. So definitely looking to play this in a black deck, but I could see some rare circumstances where I'm even considering this outside of black, where we can still equip for 2 mana. And then, yeah, whenever the equipped creature dies, draw a card. Perfect in a sacrifice deck, but also just in any aggressive deck that will uh, force the opponent to make some trades, and then this will provide a steady stream of card advantage. So as far as equipment go, this is probably the best one in the set, and I'll give it a C+. Next is Transmigrant Alter, 3 mana artifact at Uncommon, and this has kind of the Ashnaut's Alter vibes. Single black can tap it, sacrifice a creature to add triple colorless. Okay, so we're basically 2 mana ahead in the exchange. Can also pay two mana, tap it, sacrifice a creature to create a three-three colorless zombie artifact creature token. Can only be used as a sorcery. So this is the type of card we want to combine with our clay revenant, which we can bring back from the graveyard and then potentially make a three-three every turn. Even though it's going to cost us quite a bit of mana in the late game, it could still be worth it. It's also a way to maybe sacrifice opposing creatures after stealing them, and then. Uh, yeah, the extra mana to maybe ramp into something expensive could also come up. So definitely an interesting engine card, and this could range all the way from you're never going to consider this for your deck to this is maybe the best or second best card in my deck if I get the engines going. But I think 
if you can open this early enough in the drafts and build around it, it could actually be pretty powerful. So I'll give it a C plus overall. And then if you grab an altar early, of course, be on the lookout for those clay revenants, which will definitely be more than a D. Next is Scrapwork Rager, 4 mana, 2-2 two, two, Fraxian Horror at common. And this is pretty similar to the uh, Rager from Dominaria. This one costing 4 mana instead of 3, but when it enters you still draw a card at the cost of 1 life. And the upside here is that it also has Unearth for 4 mana, so you can maybe draw an extra card on the way out. So Rager seems playable, gets a C+. I think overall the format should be a little bit slower to the point where you're still happy enough playing this for 4 mana. And then the Unearth should also come up. And then we have the Goring Warplow, 6 mana for a 5-4 artifact creature with a Death Touch at common. And it also has Prototype, in which case it's 1 and a black for a 1-1. One, one. So the flexibility here is great, played early if you're on the back foot and just need a blocker. And if you can afford to wait for 6 mana, a 5-4 can deliver the beatdowns. So yeah, the Warplow, another great Prototype card, gets a C+. And then the Phyrexian Flesh Gorger. What a card. 7 mana for a 7-5 Phyrexian Worm at Mythic. Has Menace and Lifelink and Ward. Pay life equal to Phyrexian Flesh Gorger's power. So if you cast it for 7 mana, opponent has to pay 7 life just to target your Flesh Gorger with removal. Just to have the privilege to target it. And then it has the additional flexibility of Prototype. 1 and double black for a 3-3. So on turn 3 you get a Menace Life Linker that uh, will cost the opponent 3 life if they want to answer it. So great flexibility and an awesome card. And this is even a card I would consider playing outside of black. If I open this in pack 3 for instance and I'm playing maybe a blue-green uh, Power Stone Ramp deck then I'm still incredibly happy to pick this up and try and cast it for 7 mana. So. Yeah, don't necessarily have to be black to play this one, but uh, easily a bomb level card gets an A. First red card is a Goblin Blast Runner, single red for a 1-2 Goblin at common, and it gets plus 2 plus 0 and menace as long as we've sacrificed a permanent this turn. Gonna be at its best in a red-black sacrifice deck where we can consistently sacrifice permanence and uh, give this additional power. And to be honest, a, a 3 power menace creature hits pretty hard. Problem is, we're probably not consistently going to be able to activate this, especially not in the early game. Um, maybe once we get kind of later in the game, where we establish some uh, sacrifice engines, like we saw with Alter, then uh, the Blast Runner can repeatedly activate. We'll go with D for Goblin Blast Runner. I like the idea in theory, in practice probably not gonna work out but uh, I will point out there are a few free cards we can sacrifice uh, among the retro artifacts and uh, Mishra's Bauble is one of those so that's something that could combine quite nicely with the Blast Runner if we manage to pick up a few of those as we can uh, potentially enable this as early as turn 2 which could be pretty fun but overall we'll go with a D. Next is Mishra's Command, continuing our command cycle. This is X and a red for a sorcery at rare. And we get to choose two modes between a player discards up to X cards, and then they draw a card for each card discarded this way. So it could even target the opponent, but for the most part we're gonna try and improve our own hand. Then we can deal X damage to a creature, which is probably the mode we're gonna mo use most often. It can deal X damage to a planeswalker, doesn't come up very often in limited. And finally, a creature gets plus X, plus O, and haste until end of turn. So best case scenario, I guess you have an evasive creature, and then you can use the plus X, plus O to increase its power, get X damage in, and also deal X damage to an opposing creature. So in that case, uh, you're getting quite a bit of value out of the Mishra's command. But in most circumstances, even just uh, improving your hand, and then uh, dealing with an opposing creature could be nice. Problem is when those creatures become a little bit too large to take out with damage. So it does have a few limitations, but still worthy of a B. 
Then we have Monastery Swift Spear reprinted in standard once again. One mana, one two, and uncommon with haste and prowess. So this will be one of the better payoffs for the Blue Rat Spells deck. If you can get a few of these and have a nice low curve deck with lots of cantrip effects to keep enabling prowess, that could be a very scary combination. Don't think those decks are going to come together very often. I think the goal for the most part in Limited is going to be to allow players to get to cast all those expensive artifact creatures. Keep that in mind when uh, drafting Swift Spear. So I don't think it's quite going to be uh, as powerful as maybe some other limited formats, but at the very least the C can't really go too wrong with a Swift Spear if you draft a low curve aggressive deck. Next is Bitter Reunion, 2 mana enchantment at common. It says when it enters the battlefield you may discard a card. If you do, draw 2 cards. So a bit of card selection here. And for 1 mana we can sacrifice the Reunion, and then creatures we control gain haste until end of turn. So sacrificing Reunion, potentially a way to enable our Goblin Blast Runner as well, for what it's worth. Um, yeah, just an additional thing that we can uh, activate in the late game to maybe give a big creature haste. So nothing too exciting, but uh, we'll give Reunion a C, also a non-creature spell for potential prowess synergies. And next is Dwarven Forge Chanter, 2 mana, 1, 3 Dwarf Wizard at common, has Ward, pay 2 life, and prowess. So not a bad 2-drop, definitely needs ways to enable it, since at only 1 power it's not going to hit incredibly hard, but assuming you have lots of uh, card draw effects especially that can keep enabling prowess, then uh, you should be good. So we'll give this a C. Next is Felden, the Excavator, 2 mana, 2-2, two, two. Legendary Human Artifice Red Rare, has haste, cannot block, and when it is dealt damage, so maybe the opponent blocked it, exile that many cards from the top of your library, and then choose one of them until the end of your next turn, you may play that card. So Felden gets in early, gets a bit of damage in, and then the opponent will eventually be able to block it, at which point at the very least you can still get an extra card out of the deal. So yeah, it's not a bad 2-drop I would say, it gives it a C+. Next is the Horned Stone Seeker, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Lizard at Uncommon, has Menace, and when it enters we create a tapped Power Stone, and when it leaves we have to sacrifice a Power Stone unfortunately. Now if the opponent spends one of their removal spells getting rid of the Stone Seeker, which is our 2-drop at the end of the day, we're probably not too upset, and we should be able to control whether or not the Storm Seeker trades in the middle of combat, and with uh, Menace it can at least get a few attacks in early. So this actually seems like a very powerful 2-drop, and uh, ramping in this format is quite important if you want to cast those expensive artifact creatures. So we'll give the Stone Seeker a B. And you might even be able to sacrifice the Power Stone. And then, of course, if you don't have any Power Stones to sacrifice, there's no drawback when the Stone Seeker dies. Next is Mishra's Domination, 2 mana enchantment aura at common, enchanting a creature, giving it plus 2 plus 2. If it's our creature, otherwise it cannot block. So we've seen effects like this in the past, where you can either enhance your own creature or prevent something from blocking. It's an effect that some hyper-aggressive decks might be interested in, but uh, should go pretty late in the draft so you won't have any difficulty picking these up, so we'll give it a D. Obliterating Bolt is our new take on Lava Coil, 2 mana at sorcery speed at uncommon to deal 4 damage to a creature, and now also a planeswalker, and exile it in the process. So an incredibly efficient removal spell, and easily gets a B. Then we have got a Rock Hunter, 2 mana, 3 1 human soldier at common, has reach, which is pretty relevant upside since lots of flyers tend to have 3 or less toughness, so can attack early and then sit back and prevent a flyer from attacking. So not bad for a 2 drop, but uh, still just a C. Then there's Sardian Cliff Stomper, which is part of the cycle of cards that want you to have lots of basics of the same color. And there's a 2 mana 04 Minotaur Barbarian at Uncommon, 
says as long as it's your turn and you control four or more mountains, the Cliff Stomper gets plus X plus O, where X is the number of mountains you control. So this could attack as a 4-4 four four on turn 4, which is quite scary. But of course you have to commit to being mono red for that to work. And I don't think this is going to be worth it outside of mono red. So once again, one of those difficult cards to evaluate. When do you take it in the draft? When do you commit to going mono red? The stars kind of need to align. And uh, if you open this in pack 2 or 3, it's probably going to be pretty difficult to pivot into being mono red but uh, still gonna stick to a C for now. Then there's a Whirling Strike, two mana instant at common, giving plus two plus two, and first strike and trample to a creature until end of turn. So not a bad comma trick. Probably not quite as good as Sure Strike, which is plus three plus two and uh, first strike. And I guess in the more recent Dominaria, we even got to scry one on top of that. Uh, trample, of course, can sometimes come up if you just need to deal those last points of damage. The opponent won't be able to chump block their way out of it. But uh, yeah, still just a combo trick, so we'll give it a C. And then we've got the Brotherhood's End, 3 mana, Sorcery Speed, a Sweeper at Rare, dealing 3 damage to each creature and each Planeswalker. Or we can destroy all artifacts with mana value 3 or less, so it can also wipe out all Power Stone tokens. So pretty powerful effect in Limited, where it's usually about creatures, and uh, especially in a deck looking to ramp into bigger and more expensive creatures, this can make sure you get to that point by wiping all smaller stuff away. So Brotherhood's End has a lot of potential and gets a B. Can maybe even combine this with an attack to take out some larger creatures from the opponent. Conscripted Infantry is a 3-mana three 3-1 three human soldier at common. When it dies, create a 1-1 colorless soldier artifact creature token. So, yeah, not a bad 3-drop, leaves something behind when it dies. Not a very high impact card, but definitely a playable filler. We'll give it a C. Then Draconic Destiny is a 3-mana Mythic Rare Enchantment Aura. Enchanting a creature, giving it plus 1 plus 1 Flying and Haste, as well as Fire Breathing, which is pay one mana, give it plus one plus so until end of turn, so we can sink all our mana into it. And then it's also a dragon in addition to its other types. And when the enchanted creature dies, return destiny to its owner's hand. So there are a few situations where this is not quite gonna work out. If the opponent exiles our creature, we don't get it back. Or if they manage to enchant it with uh, the white or blue pacifism effects, and then there's also bounce spells that can maybe bounce the creature, in which case you don't get your uh, destiny back. So those are all situations where it's not going to be at its best. But uh, yeah, in a lot of games of Limited, this could be a way to end the game. And if the opponent doesn't have one of the aforementioned answers, they will eventually die to it. So it has a lot of potential and gets a B. Excavation Explosion, 3 mana sorcery at common, dealing 3 damage to any target including potentially the opponent, and also create a tapped Power Stone token. So yeah, I'm very happy with uh, Excavation Explosion, all about making Power Stone tokens, and this seems like a great removal spell on top of that. So it gets a B, probably the best red common in the set. Next is a Giant Cinder Maw, 3 mana, 4, 3 Dinosaur Beast at Uncommon, has Trample and says players cannot gain life. Now, there's not a huge life gain theme in Limited, so probably more of a plant for Constructed is my guess. But a 3 mana 4, 3 Trampler, still pretty decent stats as far as creatures go, so we'll give it a C+. Then there's Mechanized Warfare, 3 mana enchantment at rare, saying if a red or artifact source you control would deal a damage to an opponent, or a permanent an opponent controls, it deals that much damage plus 1 instead. Okay, so this kind of needs you to commit pretty heavily to red. Um, kind of similar to the Minotaur that we saw earlier. So it's not going to be great in any red deck necessarily. But yeah, in a very aggressive low curve deck with mostly red and artifact creatures, this could be pretty decent. Um, thinking of the uh, blue reds multicolor to drop the Iconoclast, which can make 1 1 soldier tokens. This could also combine nicely with the Warfare, not only. Does the warfare enable the iconoclast, but
but the 1-1 one -one artifacts also play well with a warfare so maybe in a blue rats prowess deck this could still be good enough so yeah you gotta pick your spots with the warfare overall give it a c think this will go relatively late in draft most of the time but in a dedicated deck this could be a powerful addition mishra excavation prodigy three mana two one legendary human artificer at uncommon kind of mirrors the uh, three mana urza in blue this one has haste and for one mana we can tap discard a card and then draw a card so as opposed to the blue version where we draw and then discard aka looting this is discard and then draw which is definitely worse since you have less information to work with and sometimes referred to as rummaging so Mishra so far looking a little bit worse than Urza. Let's see if it improves. Whenever you discard one or more artifact cards at double red, and this ability triggers only once each turn. I think I'm still in camp Urza as far as, as the three drops are concerned. But uh, yeah, the ability to add double red means we essentially net one extra mana. If we used the ability to discard, can okay, maybe discard some other way, I guess. But uh, yeah, ramping in this format is going to be important. And this is one way to do it, I suppose. So still pretty decent card overall. Um, I don't think it's quite as good as Urza, so I'm going to go with C as opposed to C+. Also the fact that Urza was in the blue color pair, which uh, went well with a blue-black archetype of draw 2, and Mishra doesn't have that same overlap, also makes it significantly worse, I think. But uh, still definitely playable and probably going to include it in most red decks. And next is the Pendragon Strongbull, a 3-mana, 2-3 Minotaur at common. Can pay 1-mana, sacrifice an artifact, and then the bull gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn, and deals 1 damage to each opponent. Okay, so another potential inclusion for the red-black sacrifice decks. Nothing exciting here, just give it a C and move on. Then there's a race to the ground, 3-mana sorcery at common cannot be countered and destroys an artifact if its mana value was one or less aka we may be trying to destroy a power stone token we also get to draw a card so not bad again disenchant effects are going to be very relevant in this limited format of course red cannot deal with enchantments but still deals with artifacts and taking out a power stone token and drawing a card especially if the opponent's trying to ramp into something big is still important but this can also take out the large artifacts that the opponent's trying to ramp into. So there's a lot to like about this one, and I'll give it a C+. Then the Scrap Smith is a 3-mana 2-1 human artificer at common, and it's part of the cycle of commons that mill 3 cards, and this one says you may put an artifact card from among the cards milled this way into your hand. If you don't, put a plus 1 counter on it. So a 3-mana three 3-2 three is kind of the fail case that also mills a few cards. Ideally a 2-1 that finds an artifact. So not quite as good as the one that finds a creature or the one that finds uh, a basic planes. Not the most exciting of these commons, I would say. Uh, red also probably doesn't care quite as much about milling as, let's say, black or green. So I'm going to end up giving the Scrap Smith a C. Then there's Arms Race, 4 mana enchantment at Uncommon, and for 4 mana we may put an artifact card from our hand onto the battlefield, and that artifact gains haste, sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. So reminiscent of Sneak Attack, but instead of paying 1 mana to put a creature in play, it's 4 mana, and it also limits it to artifacts. Now there's still plenty of expensive artifact creatures that we can cheat and play with Arms Race, but it's only going to be as early as turn 5 under most circumstances and only getting one attack in even if we do get maybe an attack in for 6 or 7 was it really worth all this effort and then our creature's gone for good maybe there's some deck where the stars align and you draft multiple copies of arms race and a ton of expensive creatures and this is going to be your main path to victory but uh, I don't think I really see it happening very often. So I'm going to give it a conservative D rating here. Then there's the Chain Dancer, 4 mana, 2 for Human Soldier at common, and for 2 mana it gains a double strike until end of turn. So 2-4 with a threat of activation to potentially deal 4 damage, 
and then there may be ways to increase its power and deal even more damage. So yeah, fine filler card, give it a C. Um, especially exciting if you can combine it with the Draconic Destiny to give it double strike and uh, then fly over for a ton of damage. But uh, in general, a 2-4 that can maybe get in two points if the opponent's unwilling to trade off for some of their creatures, and then you can spend your mana somewhere else. Then there's Mishra's Onslaught, four mana instant at common. You can choose one between making a pair of 1-1 one, one colorless soldier artifact creature tokens, or we can give our creatures plus 2, plus 0 until end of turn. So this will be at its best in kind of a red-white, go-wide tokens deck. Question is, is it quite good enough? 4 mana to make 2 tokens, pretty overpriced. And then 4 mana for plus 2, plus 0 is also kind of overpriced. And while we've seen a few cards that make tokens, I don't think there's quite the critical mass compared to a set like Dominaria United, which had several common token makers in white. So I think this one's going to fall a little bit short in this set, and I'm going to go with a D for Onslaught, but under the right circumstances this could be a pretty nice flexible card, giving you either tokens or maybe a finisher. And next is the Pyrrhic Blast. 4 mana instant at uncommon, and it's pretty similar to a fling effect, so as an additional cost, sacrifice a creature, and then it deals damage equal to the sacrificed creature's power to any target, and on top of that we also get to draw a card. So a perfect way to deal with an opposing enchantment that's preventing your creature from attacking or blocking, just sacrifice it and take something out, draw a card in the process. So that's pretty good, and um, Maybe you have enough mana to combine this with the uh, Act of Treason, which we'll get to in a second here. That seems unlikely, but uh, yeah, this card's good, not great. I don't think I want very many copies of this in my deck, but under the right circumstances you can set up some neat plays where you maybe chum block with a creature, sacrifice it, take out another creature from the opponent to essentially negate two attackers and still draw a card in the process. So it can set up some powerful plays that the opponent may not expect, but uh, still not super high on it. Give it a C. And next is Sibling a Rivalry. 4 mana sorcery at common. It says gain control of target artifact or creature until end of turn. Untap it, it gains haste. And also make a tapped power stone token. So this is the uh, Act of Treason effect I kept referencing. And uh, 4 mana, a little bit pricey, but we also get a Power Stone token for our troubles. Maybe a little awkward, because on the one hand, Rivalry is going to be great as a way to close out the game, steal the opponent's most expensive creature. At that point, we probably don't need a Power Stone token anymore. If we cast it in time for the Power Stone token to be relevant, then we're probably not stealing something incredibly exciting with it. So, yeah, the Power Stone token... While of course a nice upside, not maybe the the most synergistic with this overall effect, but uh, we've seen a ton of great synergies with the rivalry, especially in black, ways to sacrifice opposing creatures. So that's what we're trying to accomplish with the rivalry, as opposed to just stealing an opposing creature for one turn. So the question is, does this get to the power level of some of the red-black sacrifice decks we've seen in previous limited formats, thinking of the Dungeons and Dragons where Red Black became the most powerful deck. I don't think it's quite going to be as good here, but on the other hand there's also lots of very expensive creatures out there that we can potentially steal with Rivalry. So even if we don't get a ton of these in our deck, being able to steal the right creature at the right time could make a pretty big difference. So I actually think Rivalry has quite a bit of potential in this set. And um, I'm willing to give this a C plus to start out, and then we'll see whether the Steal and Sacrifice deck is real, or if it's more of a pipe dream. Then we've got Visions of Phyrexia, 4 mana enchantment at rare, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library, and you may play that card this turn. And then at the beginning of your end step, if you didn't play a card from exile this turn, create a tapped Power Stone token. So we do have to make use of the card the turn we exile it, which is a bit different from the uh, six mana a legendary artifact in blue, which can keep those cards exiled and still play them in future turns. 
but in return if we don't make use of that card we still get a power stone token so this balances out pretty nicely because assuming you're not casting the card from exile it means you maybe didn't have the mana to cast it and now with the power stone token that becomes more likely in future turns and then of course plenty of uses for power stone tokens can maybe sacrifice them as well for value so visions of phyrexia seems like an awesome card draw engine and uh, enchantments are a bit trickier to answer than um, artifacts in this set since everyone's going to be running main deck artifact hate and not every card that removes artifacts necessarily answers enchantments as well so i think this approaches bomb status and i'll go for an a for visions of phyrexia then we have unleash shell five mana instant at common dealing a five damage to target creature or planeswalker and two damage to that permanence controller so a bit expensive for a five damage removal spell but also deals to more damage and uh, yeah sometimes you just need some of these expensive removal spells can't afford to play too many but especially in a very aggressive deck thinking of maybe a red white aggro or a blue red kind of prowess spells deck this could be a great curve topper to clear uh, the opponent's largest blocker get a nice attack in and deal some additional damage on top so c plus for unleash shell then there's the fall of krug six mana sorcery at uncommon can choose target opponent destroy target a land that player controls and then the fall of krug also deals three damage to that player and one damage to each creature they control so yeah this card has a lot going for it although the main effect remains six mana to destroy a land is that worth it i don't think so um especially in a set with lots of power stone tokens people have other ways of uh, ramping and getting their expensive creatures in play so losing a land while it could be a setback in a set with lots of expensive creatures it's maybe not quite at the end of the world and in the meantime we had to spend six mana on this so not a huge fan of the fall of krug could be an effective sideboard card admittedly if the opponent has lots of one toughness creatures then i could see bringing this in out of the sideboard as an extra sort of sweeper effect to deal with them um, but yeah overall i'm gonna stick to a d for fall of krug next is a tyrant of carrier ridges six mana four five dragon at rare it flies and when it enters it deals four damage to any target so quite the uh, flame tongue cavu here and then it also has fire breathing for a red mana gets plus one plus so until end of turn definitely a bomb level card not quite the s tier but uh yeah this comes down takes care of something pretty relevant and can always go upstairs to deal four damage to the opponent and then uh, if it doesn't get answered it will certainly win the game in a few attacks but uh doesn't quite have that built-in protection necessarily but uh yeah definitely a very powerful bomb and then over the top i don't think i'm even going to read this one i'll just give it an f and let uh, the commander players have fun with it and then it's time to take a look at artifacts in red mishra's research desk one mana uncommon artifact can pay one mana tap it sacrifice the desk and then exile the top two cards of your library choose one of them and until end of turn or until the end of your next turn rather you may play that card okay so it's pretty strange to see an artifact with an earth that's not a creature but it does also have an earth for one and a red so it's a kind of a slow way to gain incremental card advantage also a way to maybe sacrifice a permanence to enable those synergies so it's got that going for it uh, can maybe play the desk and sacrifice it to a completely different effect if we just need a cheap artifact to sacrifice so it does have a couple cute synergies and then if we're just playing it at face value it's two mana to get our first card and then uh, three mana to get our second card out of it so we are paying quite a bit of mana and uh we have to make use of those exiled cards while they stay exiled so that can also lead to some awkward sequencing so yeah overall not the biggest fan of uh, mishra's research desk but i can see some uh, situations where you just want as many sacrifice effects as possible or you just want to fill your deck with cheap artifacts so i'll go with uh, maybe a c for the research desk next is scrap work mutt two mana two one dog at common 
when it enters you may discard a card and if you do draw a card so perfectly fine two drop giving a bit of card selection and then it also has unearth for one red so you can bring it back later to maybe still improve your hands and uh, get an attack in for two maybe even sacrifice it to some other effect so the mud seems great a nice two drop with lots of late game utility plenty of synergies to go with it as well so important role player then we've got uh, Frexian Dragon Engine, which we've already covered when talking about Mishra in the multicolor section. This card's great. I don't think I've given it a rating yet, but uh, this is a bomb level card, I think. It gets an A, very good early, can deal a ton of damage, and then in the late game you can still unearth it to massively improve your hand and get some more damage in. Next is Mishra's Juggernaut. 5 mana, 5-3, five, Juggernaut at common, it tramples, attacks each combat if able, and also has unearth for 6 mana. A little bit of an expensive card, but it does hit relatively hard, and uh, yeah, the unearth also makes it tricky for the opponent to block, they're not necessarily going to want to trade a creature for it, so it will often end up dealing uh, the full 5 points with unearth if you time it correctly. And uh, if you're playing a, an aggressive red deck, that's probably an effect you're quite interested in. So at first glance, the Juggernaut doesn't seem amazing, but I think it's actually going to play out pretty well. So I'll give it a C+. And then also a card that of course benefits from having a few combo tricks to back it up if you're forced to attack. Then there's the Blitz Automaton, 7 mana, 6, 4, Construct at common, and has haste. And it also has prototype, so we can play it for 3 mana, 2 and a red. And then it's a 3-2 with haste instead. So it has a bit of uh, flexibility, which is nice. And uh, yeah, fine on turn 3 if you can attack with it. And then if you can get to 7 mana eventually, especially if the opponent doesn't plan for a 6-4 hasty attacker, this could swing the race back in your favor. So we'll give this a C plus as well. Then there's the Heavyweight Demolisher, 7 mana, Artifact Creature Construct at Uncommon, and this is a pretty big one, 8-6 with Menace. But there's also a drawback at the beginning of your upkeep, tap the Demolisher unless you pay 3 mana, and that it also has Unearth for 8 mana, 6 double red. Okay, so you have to be pretty serious about ramping if you want to try and play and unearth the Demolisher. So unlike the blue prototype creature that you have to untap paying 3 mana, this one you have to pay up front and uh, you have to make the decision in your upkeep. So it's a serious commitment, but we also get some serious damage output and uh, not that easy for the opponent to block. Can potentially take out two creatures from the opponent on two separate occasions. Tricky card to evaluate. I don't know how many ramp power stone tokens the red decks are going to have on average. Feels like other colors are better suited at ramping. But uh, I'm still going to give this at the very least a C. And uh, potentially a card that, let's say, a blue-green Power Stone ramp deck can splash for the Unearth. And then the 7 mana shouldn't be too much of a challenge. Then there's the Dragon Engine, 8 mana, 5-5 five, five Flyer at Uncommon. And can also pay 2 mana to give it plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. And has Prototype, in which case it's a 1-3 for 2 and a red could once again play this outside of a red deck if you've got enough ramp and then uh, 8 mana might be more achievable and then the 3 mana version could still offer additional flexibility if needed so while expensive the dragon engine is a serious way to end the game so I'll give it a C plus as well and then last but not least the skitter beam battalion 9 mana for a 4-4 mythic rare construct has Trample and Haste, and when it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, create two tokens that are copies of it. So that's potentially 12 power of Trample and Haste, and uh, also has a flexibility of Prototype, 5 mana, in which case it's a 2-2, two -two. so then it's only 6 power of uh, Trample and Haste, which is still pretty good. But uh, if you can ever get to 9 mana, this will uh, certainly help you end the game. So powerful card, I think it's bomb level not quite an s but uh, certainly deserving of an a first green card alloy animist single green for a 1-1 human druid at uncommon 
and for Tuna Green, until end of turn, target non-creature artifact you control becomes a 4-4 artifact creature. So maybe a way to animate our Power Stone tokens, I assume. An interesting mana sink. Green will have access to quite a few Power Stone tokens if you build around it. And uh, a 4-4 is pretty big. Question is, is it worth all the mana investments? And are you maybe not better off just casting a big creature in the first place instead of continuously having to activate this? So I'm not super sold on the Alloy Animist. And I think I'm going to give the Animist a uh, C grade overall. Next is Audacity. Single green for an enchantment aura and uncommon. Enchants a creature, giving it plus 2 plus 0 and trample. And then when Audacity is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, draw a card. If the opponent has a traditional removal spell for your creature, at least uh, you're not down two cards necessarily. Um, but of course there are still other answers available, like we mentioned earlier. Various enchantments to shut down your creature. Those are still scenarios where the... Uh, Audacity could end up two for one in yourself. Maybe with a double strike creature or a flying creature, the damage is worth it. Um, still probably going to stick to a C for Audacity. Next is a Bushwhack, single green for a sorcery at uncommon. Can either search your library for a basic land card, put it into our hand, or we can fight uh, two creatures. So either kind of a lay of the land or a prey upon. So I guess a uh, Prey of the Land, not bad for one mana, the flexibility is great. In the early game you might need extra lands, and then in the late game you can fight, and green tends to have some very large creatures. So I like C plus for Bushwhack. Next is the Citinal Stalwart, single green for a 1-1 Elf Druid Soldier at common. Can tap, and then tap an untapped artifact or creature you control to add one mana of any color. So reminiscent of the uh, Sentinel from Kaldheim, which ended up being a pretty important role player in that limited format. Will the Stalwart live up to the Sentinel? I kind of doubt it, uh, especially in a set with so many Power Stone tokens and most of the expensive creatures being artifacts anyway. Don't necessarily see myself splashing a ton in this format, which is another situation where Stalwart could come in handy. So could be a role player in some decks and uh, yeah if you have a couple stalwarts then splashing becomes an option but uh, not gonna go out of my way to pick these early so I'll start with a C. Next is a Giant Growth another classic reprint single green for a common instant giving plus three plus three until end of turn so totally serviceable combo trick gets a C. Then there's a Teething Wormlet single green for a 1 1 worm at rare, and has a Death Touch as long as you control three or more artifacts, which should be quite feasible in this limited format. And then whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under your control, you gain one life, and if it's the first time this turn, you also get a plus one plus one counter. So, not bad if you can play it early and string together some artifacts, works well with Power Stone tokens, of course. And uh, just be careful that the opponent cannot remove your third artifact at instant speed, make you lose death touch, because that could lead to a disaster. But uh, yeah, I think the Wormlet has potential. I'll give it a C+. Next is the Ergothian Sprite, 2 mana, 2-2, two, two, fairy at common. It says it cannot be blocked by artifact creatures, and for 7 mana we can put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on the sprite. So not being able to be blocked by artifacts, certainly relevant in this set. And then has a good mana sink as well, can use our Power Stone tokens to pay 7. So seems like a above average 2-drop, which gets a C+. Awaken the Woods, X double green for a mythic rare sorcery, creating X 1-1 one, one green forest dryad land creature tokens. So if you're familiar with the Dryad Arbor, this makes X of those. And yeah, that's another way to potentially ramp and cast those big expensive artifacts. So seems like a pretty decent card. Um, of course, you cannot use Power Stone tokens to cast this in the first place, which is a bit of a drawback. But uh, let's say you cast this for X equals two or three. 
then uh, next turn you could cast an 8 drop so sign me up I'll give this a B then there's the Blanchwood Prowler 2 mana 1-1 one, one elemental at common part of the common cycle that mills 3 and let's find out if this one's any good we can put a land card from among the cards milled this way into our hand if we don't put a plus one counter on it. So yeah, this is one of the better ones, very cheap to play, and could be a 1-1 one -one that finds a land, which is good value. Can maybe sacrifice the 1-1 one -one in kind of a black-green graveyard deck, which is also the archetype that's probably most interested in milling in the first place. So this is a pretty solid role player, and one of the better two drops gets a C+. Next is Epic Confrontation, 2 mana for a sorcery at common. Target creature we control gets plus 1, plus 2 until end of turn, and then it fights target creature we don't control. So plus 1, plus 2 is definitely a significant bonus when getting into a fight, makes it much more likely we can actually take out something bigger and have our creature survive. So this is probably the better common removal spell in green in this set, and gets a B. Fauna Shaman is back, a reprint, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Elf Shaman at rare. Can pay a green, tap, and discard a creature card to search our library for any creature card, reveal it, and put it into our hand. So, yeah, decent card, can play it early, and then if we get to the mid to late game and maybe top deck a cheap creature we're not that interested in, we can go looking for our curve toppers. So, provide some relevant utility while still being a fine creature to play early and uh, overall gets a B grade. Gaia's Gift, 2 mana instant at common, and this is another combat trick. Putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature we control gains reach, trample, hexproof, and indestructible until end of turn. At some point they're gonna add enough keywords where I'm gonna give this more than just a C, but uh, that's not today. Next is Serenth Steelseeker, 2 mana, 1 2 human artificer scout at uncommon. Says whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under our control, look at the top card of our library. If it's a land card, we may reveal it and put it into our hands. If not, we can put that card into our graveyard instead. Ideally, we can find a couple lands with a Steelseeker when artifacts enter, as then it turns into a nice source of card advantage, makes sure we can keep hitting our land drops. So if we play this on turn 2, kind of reminds me of the, uh, I believe it was the Green Seeker it was called, um, which could tap to reveal the top card, and if it's a land you can put it in hand, which ended up being one of the better cards in that limited format. So the Steel Seeker, maybe not quite as good since it requires a bit of effort to get it going, but uh, could also live up to those expectations. So I'm going to go with C plus for Steel Seeker. Next is the Honor Guard, 2 mana, 3 1 human soldier at common, and has a ward 2. Don't know if this card really needs ward 2, but maybe makes it for a better target for potential auras to enchant it. Overall, I think a 3 1 probably is the type of card that least needs a ward 2. It's going to trade off for any opposing creature anyway, so you're not necessarily going to try and target it with a removal. Kind of a, a disappointing 2 drop, but probably still at least a C. And next is Ergothian Opportunist, 3 mana, 3-2 three, human scout at common, and when it enters, makes a tapped power stone token. Now we're talking, this is the 3 drop I want to be casting in pretty much every green deck, while ramping into bigger and better things, so that gets a C+. Blanchwood Armor, reprinted, and kind of completes our cycle of cards that care about having lots of basics of one color, giving the enchanted creature plus one plus one for each forest we control. So pretty powerful three mana enchantment. Assuming you're mono green, outside of a mono green deck, probably not interested. So this falls kind of in a similar category as to some of the previous cards of uh, this cycle, which is a C. I believe only the white one I've given C plus. Then there's a Burwing, a Razor Maw, three mana for two beast at common and when it dies, mill four cards. So I will point out this is a beast to synergize with the uh, multicolor Taunos, the toy maker. So if you ever want to get that going, make sure you pick up your Razor Maws, as it's also in the same color pair. But uh, yeah, maybe an okay filler card for your black-green graveyard deck, 
that wants to fill the graveyard with lots of creatures. So that's probably where you're looking to play the Razor Maw. Outside of it, just kind of a filler 3-drop, but uh, will be serviceable. Gets a C. Next is a Fog of War, 3 mana instant at common, and gains 1 life for each creature on the battlefield, and prevents all combat damage that would be dealt this turn by creatures with power 3 or less. So not quite the fog we were promised, and it's usually the larger creatures whose damage you want to prevent. Uh, so yeah, I don't think this is particularly great. There might be some matchups where everyone's creatures are quite small, and then this could maybe set up some interesting plays, but uh, I think you're better off with it in the sideboard. Then we have Gwena, Eyes of Gaia, 3 mana, 2, 3, Legendary Elf Druid Scout at rare, and it can tap to add 2 mana in any combination of colors, and can spend this mana only to cast creature spells or activate abilities of a creature or creature card. And in a set with lots of expensive artifact creatures, this seems like the perfect card to play on turn 3. And then whenever we cast a creature spell with power 5 or greater, we can even put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Gwena and untap it. So we can potentially still cast something afterwards. Yeah, this card seems great, at the very least a B. Then there's the Perimeter Patrol, 3 mana, 3-3 three, three Human Soldier at common. Whenever an artifact enters a battlefield under your control, the patrol gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. Fine filler card, gets a C. Then we have Titania, Voice of Gaia, which is another meld creature. This 3-mana, uh, 3-4 three three, Legendary Elemental at Mythic has reach, and whenever one or more land cards are put into your graveyard from anywhere, you gain 2 life. And we've seen quite a few self-mill effects in green and black-green especially, so that's where Titania will shine. And then this pairs with a land, which I'll show here, Argoth Sanctum of Nature, which is a rare land, enters a battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary creature, or a green creature more specifically. Taps for green, and for 4 mana we can tap it to create a 2-2 green bear creature token, and then also mill 3 cards, and can only be used at sorcery speed. So milling three cards, I guess it's good if you have uh, Titania in play, as you can potentially gain some life in the process. Although in limited, you're only going to be able to activate this so many times before you're out of cards in your library. So maybe that's where you need the uh, blue five drop Keeper of the Cadence to put cards from your graveyard back into your deck. But uh, yeah, that's probably not going to come up very often. So. Argoth, great in combination with Titania, but a bit risky and limited since you're only going to be able to activate it a few times before you run out of cards. But if you get both in play at the same time, then at the beginning of your upkeep, you can meld both into what's eventually going to be Titania, Gaios Incarnate, which is a creature with Vigilance, Reach, Trample, and Haste. Power and Toughness each equal to the number of lands you control, and when it enters the battlefield, return all land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Okay, so that's a, a lot of text. And then four mana can also potentially animate one of our lands, putting four plus one plus one counters on it. So if you live the dream here and get both in limited and actually get to transform it, then uh, more power to you. But uh, let's evaluate Titania kind of individually outside of the melt pair. And uh, yeah, it's still a 3-mana three 3-4 three, with reach, so pretty decent stats. Should get at least a C+, plus, and then can maybe gain a bit of life if you happen to mill a few lands. And then we'll get to Argoth once we discuss the lands. Next is the Wasteful Harvest, 3-mana instant at common, mill 5 cards, and then you may put a permanent card from among the cards milled this way into your hand. So should not really be a problem as uh, lands and creatures are all fair game. So in a deck that's really serious about milling and setting up the graveyard, which presumably is black-green, then the Harvest could actually be an important role player. Maybe also good with Unearth synergies. So those are the types of cards you want to look for with Harvest. Otherwise it's just 3 mana to find a creature in the top 5, which is fine but not really worth spending 3 mana on for the most part. So we'll give this a C. 
Then Fade from History, 4 mana sorcery at rare, says each player who controls an artifact or enchantment creates a 2-2 green bear creature token, and then destroy all artifacts and enchantments. So normally this would be kind of a weird sideboard card. In this set I think it's actually a bomb, and I'm gonna give it an A. There's just gonna be so many artifacts and sometimes enchantments in play that this could be quite a blowout. And if you draw this, you can sort of plan around it, even though your green deck might also have a few artifacts in play. I think you're still going to be happy to play this in pretty much any green deck. Then there's a Hoarding Recluse, 4 mana 2-3 Spider, at common with Reach and Death Touch. And when it dies, put up to one other target card from a graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. So it seems like a fine filler card and gets a C. Then there's Obstinate Baloth, another reprint, 4 mana, 4-4 four, four beast at uncommon. When it enters, it gain 4 life, and if the opponent makes you discard it, then you can put it in play instead of the graveyard. So looking forward to seeing screenshots of opponents accidentally making you discard Obstinate Baloth instead of something else, but uh, still just a fine card at 4 mana, 4-4 four, four that gains a bit of life, so can't really go wrong with the Baloth. Give it a C+. Plus. And then a shoot down. This is four mana. I, at first I thought this was a three mana sorcery at common. And can exile an artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying. Usually this is reserved for the sideboard. In this set I think it's a very much a main deckable card. And even a pretty good one at that. And I'll give it a C+. Plus. Then there's Taunos Tinkering. Four mana instant at common. Can put two plus one plus one counters on target artifact creature or land you control, untap that permanent, and if it's not a creature yet, it becomes a creature. The most powerful part of this is that it untaps a permanent, so I think the best case scenario, you're just kind of in a racing situation, you tap all your creatures, the opponent goes to attack back, and now you get to maybe untap one of your creatures and put two counters on it, although it is a bit transparent, so the opponent may be able to play around it, and maybe punish you with kind of an instant speed play of their own. So not super high on the tinkering. Uh, if it lines up, it could be quite a blowout, but I think especially after a week or two of the format being around, people will know to play around it. So I'll give it a D. Then there's the excavation, five mana sorcery at uncommon, creating three tapped power stone tokens, and you gain three life. So this is huge for the Power Stone ramp decks that are looking to play some expensive creatures, potentially those with prototype that can cost 8 or 9 mana. There's even a 10 mana artifact creature in green at common. So definitely plenty of ways to spend those Power Stone tokens. There's plenty of activated abilities as well. So overall I'm quite high on the excavation. Don't know if it's quite in the B range, since by itself of course it doesn't really impact the board. But uh, if you can play this on curve and follow it up with a big creature, you're definitely a favorite to win the game. So I'll give this a C+. Then there's Gaia's Courser, 5 mana, 4-5, Centaur, Soldier, and Uncommon. And when it attacks, if there are 3 or more creature cards in your graveyard, you get to draw a card. So at its best in the black-green graveyard deck, and uh, yeah, ideally you can back it up with maybe a combat trick or a bit of removal to clear a path, so you can attack with it multiple times. And uh, if that's the case, it could be a nice source of card advantage. So I'll give it a C+. Could also maybe attack, trade for an opposing creature, and then if you're in black-green, you might have plenty of ways to bring it back from the graveyard once again. And that can also set up some nice value chains. So C+, seems appropriate. And then there's the Gnarl Root Paul Bearer, a 6 mana 5-5 five, five, Tree Folk Druid at common, has Trample, and when it enters a battlefield, target creature gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. So this could be huge if you've got kind of a dedicated self-mill deck, so black-green once again. And uh, yeah, this could represent a ton of extra damage. 6 mana 5-5, five, five, maybe a little overcosted. Once again, can't use our Power Stone tokens to cast this one, so that's a drawback. But uh, yeah, in the right deck, this could be pretty decent. So we'll give it a C. And then Titania's Command. 
6 mana rare sorcery to complete our command cycle. Choose two modes between exiling a player's graveyard, gaining one life for each card exiled this way. We can search our library for up to two land cards and put them on the battlefield tapped. Or, probably the modes we're going to choose, make a pair of 2-2 two, two green bear creature tokens, and finally put two plus one plus one counters on each creature you control. So even on an empty board, this could make two 4-4 four, four bear tokens, and of course you're probably going to have some other creatures in play that benefit from those plus one plus one counters. So Titania's command is definitely a bomb, and gets an A. Time to take a look at the green artifact cards, starting with the Haywire Might. One mana for a 1-1 insect at uncommon. When it dies, we gain two life, and for a single green, we can sacrifice it to exile target's non-creature artifact or non-creature enchantment. So the non-creature part is quite relevant, of course. I think this card's still potentially main deckable. There's probably enough non-creature artifacts and enchantments running around, and uh, ideally you've got some additional synergy with this. So I'll give it a C. Next is the Mask of the Jade Crafter, a 2 mana uncommon artifact. And this one's a little strange, so we can pay X, tap it, and sacrifice the mask to make an XX colorless golem artifact creature token. Can only be used at sorcery speed. And then it also has Unearth for 2 and a green. So in the late game, if we've got a ton of mana, we can bring it back and then sacrifice it once again, as it will of course have haste and uh, there's no problem with activating it right away. I guess artifacts don't even suffer from summoning sickness in the first place. But uh, yeah, Mask of the Jade Crafter. If we played on turn 2, probably looking to activate this around turn 5, turn 6, ideally after maybe creating some Power Stone tokens to help you ramp, and then in the very late game could potentially come back to make another large Golem token. So this card's okay. Um, but you do need to kind of work for it and make sure you have enough ramp to truly make it shine. So not super high on that mask, but I think it is playable in the more dedicated ramp decks. So I'll give it a C. Next is a Simeon Simulacrum, 3 mana for a 2-1 ape at rare. And when it enters the battlefield, put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on target creature you control. So we can target something that's already in play to get a nice attack in. And then the Simulacrum also has Unearth for 2 and double green, so we can potentially place two counters elsewhere. And uh, yeah, that's a lot of power and toughness, so pretty decent card and gets a B. Then there's the Perennial Behemoth, 5 mana, 2, 7, artifact creature beast at rare. Says you may play lands from your graveyard. And then it also has Unearth, strangely for just double green. So this will be at its best in the self-mill archetypes, where you end up putting tons of cards in your own graveyard, and then the behemoth will let you potentially unearth it, and then play an extra land from your graveyard to get a bit of value. 2-7 blocks pretty well, so helps you play those longer, grindy games. So yeah, behemoth seems okay, bit of a, a strange card for sure, but we'll go with C+. And then there's the Rootwire Amalgam, 5 mana, 5-5, five, five, Mythic Rare Golem. And it's one of those prototype cards, so you can play it for 1 and a green, in which case it's a 2-3. But we're definitely going to want a green mana for the 3 and double green activated ability. You can sacrifice it, and then create an XX Colorless Golem Artifact Creature Token, where X is 3 times the Amalgam's power, and it also gains haste until end of turn. So, can play the Amalgam on turn 5. And then on turn 6, so we could be attacking with a 15-15 with haste. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Um, yeah, this card's definitely quite good. Of course, could still be chum blocked easily, but if the opponent doesn't come up with an answer right away, the 15-15 is probably going to win the game. So Bomb gets an A. If we played for 2 mana, not quite as exciting, although still a 6-6 haste on turn 5, which isn't bad. Next is the Cradle Clear Cutter, 6 mana for a 3-6 that can tap, adding green equal to the Clear Cutter's power, so 3 by default. And it also has Prototype for 2 and a green, in which case it's a 1-3 that will tap for single green, but could potentially benefit from enchantments like Audacity to increase its power by 2, which will then tap for 3 mana instead. And other potential pump spells like Giant Growth could give you a nice mana boost. So those are synergies to keep in mind. 
But uh, yeah, six mana might seem a lot for a mana creature, but when you look at some of the upcoming cards, it will make sense why tapping for mana is still good even at six. So Clear Cutter gets a C+. And then the Boulder Branch Golem, a seven mana, six, five. And it also has prototype for three and a green, in which case it's a three, three. And the Golem enters the battlefield, gaining a life equal to its power. So fine card, nothing too exciting on this one, but we'll get a C. Iron Craw Crusher, seven mana, four, six, worm at uncommon. Has prototype for two and double green, in which case it's a two, five. And when it attacks, target attacking creature gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is the crusher's power. So let's say we play this as a 4-drop, then it can attack as a 4-5 if we target itself, but it could also target a different creature if that lines up better. So quite a bit of flexibility, and of course if we cast it for 7 mana, could attack as an 8-6, so it doesn't mess around. So crusher against a C+. Then there's the Rust Goliath, 10 mana for a 10-10 artifact creature construct at common, mind you, and it has reach and trample. So if we get to 10 mana, this is quite the payoff, and we have the flexibility of prototype, in which case we get a 5 mana, 3-5, still with reach and trample. So very useful abilities to have in a green deck where you want to stop flyers from killing you, and if we ever cast this for 10 mana and get to attack, hopefully not get it stolen by the uh, Act of Treason of the set, then uh, we should be in the clear. So Russ Goliath gets a C+. And time to take a look at the remaining artifacts that we haven't covered yet, at least artifacts from the main set. There will still be some retro artifacts left afterwards. Clay Champion, X and 4 mana, so it has a pretty strange casting cost. Can play it for 4 mana, can play it for maybe six mana. If we have additional mana in the late game, starts out as a 2-2, two, two, but we'll play this in a green and or white deck because it enters a battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it for each double green spent to cast it. So if we cast this for four green mana, it could be a four mana 8-8 eight, eight, essentially, which is pretty big. And then the white counterpart, if it enters the battlefield, we can choose up to two other target creatures we control, and for each double white spent to cast Clay Champion, put a plus one plus one counter on each of them. So pretty powerful card. Realistically, play this in a green-white deck, and this is a pretty good incentive to go green-white, and then let's say we play this for double green, double white for mana, then this will be a 5-5 five, five that gets to put a plus one counter on two different other creatures, which is a great deal. So Clay Champion gets an A, and then of course as the game progresses, you can sink more mana into it and get more plus one counters. Then there's the Blade Coil Serpent, which is kind of the Grixis counterpart. This X and 6 mana for a 5-4 Mythic Rare Serpent. For every double blue we get to draw a card, for every double black each opponent discards a card, and for every double red it gets plus one plus so, trample and haste until end of turn. So can't really go wrong with either color pair, probably gonna only be two of the three colors, blue probably the best one to draw additional cards, but uh, another bomb level card, um, either an A or a B, I'll go with B for Blade Coil Serpent, since uh, yeah, at six mana it's kind of pricey, and if uh, you're planning to use Power Stones to cast the Serpent, you're maybe not gonna get the full benefit from it. Next is Goblin Firebomb, 1 mana for an artifact at common, has flash, and for 7 mana we can tap and sacrifice the Firebomb to destroy target permanent. So a bit strange that it has flash, but there may be some instant speed cards you can enable with this, maybe the green-white uh, multicolor 2-drop that can put a plus one plus one counter somewhere, so that could come up, and then by sacrificing it you also potentially enable some sacrifice synergies, Although 7 mana is pretty expensive for a removal spell, so not super interested in the firebomb, but there will be some scenarios where you still run it. Then we've got Spectrum Sentinel, 1 mana for a 1-2 uncommon soldier, has protection from multicolored, and whenever a non-basic land enters under the opponent's control, we gain 1 life. Not super relevant for limited, the life gain part of it. Protection from multicolored, 
could come up, but I more see this as a, a narrow sideboard card than a card I really want to main deck, so I'll give it a D. Next is the Aeronaut Wings, 2 mana for an equipment at common, gets plus 1 plus 2 and flying if we equip for 2 mana. Don't think this is a set that lends itself to equipment, since if we want to cast some of those expensive 6, 7, 8 mana cards, we're going to have to dedicate most of our deck to lands and then ways to ramp to cast those creatures in a timely fashion. So there's just not going to be a lot of room for additional utility artifacts like equipment and uh, wings being one of them. So I think this is going to kind of be left to the wayside a little bit and gets a D. Then there's the Coastal Bulwark 2 mana 1 3 wall at common, has Defender and gets plus 2 plus 0 as long as you control an island. So I could have put this in the blue section since you're probably not going to play this outside of a blue deck. But it can also pay 2 mana, tap and surveil 1 for some additional card selection. So not a bad early blocker for your more controlling strategies. And uh, this one gets a C. Then we've got Energy Refractor, 2 mana artifact at common. When it enters, draw a card. And for 2 mana, we can add 1 mana of any color. So we're losing a bit of mana in the exchange, but it can filter our mana to potentially help splash some uh, powerful uh, off-color cards. So that's still useful. And it's also an artifact we can maybe sacrifice. I mentioned when talking about the blue cards, there's the 3 mana... Uh, splitting the Power Stone, which requires us to sacrifice an artifact. So going turn 2, Refractor, turn 3, play that card. That could be a nice sequence to help us ramp. So having an artifact that replaces itself that we can sacrifice, maybe even the in the red-black sacrifice decks, is also pretty nice. So I think this actually ends up being a pretty uh, nice role player in some decks. And we'll give it a C. Levitating Statue, 2 mana artifact at uncommon, it flies, but it's not a creature by default. Whenever we cast a non-creature spell, we can put a plus 1 counter on it, and then for 2 mana we can activate it, turning it into a 1-1 one, one artifact creature until end of turn, and then of course gets additional plus 1 counters as well to make it bigger. So being able to decide when to animate the statue is nice, can even do it in the opponent's turn. Uh, problem, I guess, with the statue is... We want to play it somewhat early, so it can accumulate more plus one counters. But at the same time, it's not directly impacting the board. And then we're also still playing an artifact in a set where people are main decking artifact removal. So if we spend a ton of resources growing the statue as our main win condition, it may not be the most uh, kind of a secure win condition out there. So even though it's not always a creature, the opponent might still have answers to it. So potentially a powerful card uh, in the right deck. I'm thinking kind of a blue rats spells deck. That's probably where this is going to shine, but uh, still going to stick to a C. Then there's the mine worker, and this is part of kind of a cycle of these assembly workers at common. This is a two mana, two one, can tap to gain one life. And if we control creatures named power plant worker and tower worker, we gain three life instead. So this is kind of a callback to the Urza lands, the power plant, mine, and tower. And yeah, this is pretty cute. I don't think it's very good, but uh, gets a D. The Stone Brain, more of a sideboard card for Constructed. Can't really think of too many limited applications unless the opponent has some bomb and you're playing best of three and you can use this to take care of it. But I'll just give it an F to make it easy. Next is Thran, Power Suit, 2 mana, Uncommon Equipment. Equips for 2 mana, giving plus 1 plus 1 for each aura and equipment attached, and also grants a ward 2. So, a lot of abilities, but at the end of the day it's only plus 1 plus 1. You're probably not going to have a ton of auras and equipments in this set, so I'm not all that interested in the Power Suit. Give it a D. Then the Liberator, Urza's Battle, Thopter, 3 mana, 1, 2, Legendary, Thopter at rare, has Flash and Flying, and says you may cast colorless spells and artifact spells as though they had Flash, which is quite the upgrade in a set full of artifacts. And whenever you cast a spell, if the amount of mana spent to cast it is greater than the Liberator's power, put a plus one plus one counter on the Liberator. So it will kind of naturally grow as we curve out, 
So yeah, it doesn't take many counters for this to turn into a real threat. And then flashing in all our spells also makes it difficult for the opponent to predict what we'll do next. So actually kind of like this one and I'll give it a B. Then the reconstructed Thopter is a 3 mana 2-1 flyer with unearth for 2 mana. Pretty simple, nice uncommon here and uh, yeah, can get in some evasive damage and then later still come back to potentially get in for two more. So I'll give this a, th a C plus. Next is Supply Drop, three mana artifact at common, has flash, and when it enters can pump one of our creatures, giving it plus two plus two until end of turn. And then for four mana we can tap and sacrifice to still draw a card later in the game. So yeah, as far as combat tricks go, it's nice that this eventually draws a card. Although it's kind of expensive to eventually get there, so I wouldn't overdo it on the supply drops. But if you really want to play a combo trick, especially in a color that maybe typically doesn't get access to those, this could be a fine filler card. Give it a C. Then the Stasis Coffin is a strange one, 3 mana legendary artifact at rare. Can pay 2 mana tap and exile the coffin, and then you gain protection from everything until your next turn. So this is kind of like a fog effect, so the opponent attacks, you activate your coffin, you don't take any damage, and then you can maybe attack back. Of course the opponent will see it coming since it's going to be in play, so it's probably worse than a fog effect, which is already pretty bad. So can't think of too many scenarios where I'm interested in the coffin, but I'm sure someone can come up with a, a scenario where they would consider it. So I'll go with a D, probably should just be an F, but... Uh, Let's move on to Thran Spider, 3 mana, 2-4, artifact creature spider at rare, has reach, and when it enters, we get a power stone token, but so does our opponent. So never like giving my opponent free stuff, but we're still getting a power stone ourselves, as well as a 2-4 reach for 3, which isn't bad. And then also has a 7 mana activated ability, which we can use our power stone tokens for saying look at the top four cards of our library, reveal an artifact card from among them and put it into our hand. So not a bad mana sink in the more dedicated artifact ramp decks. So the spider gets a B. Then there's tower worker, part of the cycle here. Three mana, one three assembly worker at common has reach, can tap for a colorless. And then if we control creatures named mine worker and power plant worker, then we add triple colorless instead. So even without all the extra workers and uh, the power plants or whatever, the uh, tower worker itself is not bad as a three drop that helps us ramp, since uh, there's quite a few payoffs for ramping in this set, as you may have noticed. So tower worker easily gets a C plus, and you definitely don't need to jump through any additional hoops to make it worthwhile. Then the Slagstone Refinery is a bit of a strange one. Four mana, uncommon artifact. And then when the refinery or another non-token artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield or is put into exile from the battlefield, create a tapped power stone token. So maybe there's some interesting synergies with refinery. Get it going alongside the black altar and the uh, creature that you can keep looping back out of the graveyard. Maybe that's where you want Refinery to make additional Power Stones. Seems like kind of a convoluted engine that you're trying to set up at that point. So I'm not really sold on it, but uh, could have some interesting applications. Still gonna give it a D. Next is the Stone Retrieval Unit, 4 mana, 2, 3 construct at common. And when it enters, create a tapped Power Stone token. As much as I like Power Stone tokens, there is a point where we're paying a little bit too much mana for them. The Retriever unit is kind of borderline here, whether or not it's good or not. Um, so it probably means it's just a C card I will consider playing in some decks, but uh, could also see cutting it if I'm not really interested in the ramp. Then there's a Symmetry Matrix for mana artifact at Uncommon, saying whenever a creature with power equal to its toughness enters a battlefield under your control, you can pay one generic mana if you do draw a card. So it could be a nice source of card advantage, although you'll have to double check how many creatures actually fit the description to draw additional cards. And you also need to have some dedicated ramp to make sure you can get this going in time. So that definitely limits the amount of decks where you can play Matrix successfully. 
but uh, could still be a decent source of card advantage. So we'll go with C for Matrix. Then there's the Power Plant Worker to complete the trifecta. 5 mana, 4-4 four, four Assembly Worker at common, and for 3 mana the Worker gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. Can only activate this once each turn, but if we control the Mine Worker and Tower Worker, we can put 2 plus 1 counters on it instead. So yeah, not bad if you get all three in play, but even without the workers, I think the uh, power plant is totally fine as a 4-4 that can grow up to a 6-6. Once again, the threat of activation is what matters, so you don't have to necessarily spend the three mana each turn. So yeah, workers, fine filler, not an exciting card, but if you're lacking a bit of top end, then this could fit the bill. Gets a C. Then there's a Steel Exemplar, and this also goes into those same monocolored decks that some of the uncommons kind of incentivize us to. This uh, 5 mana 4 4 wizard at uncommon, it tramples and enters the battlefield with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, unless 2 or more colors of mana were spent to cast it. So I guess you could still potentially play this successfully in a uh, 2 color deck if you've got a few power stones to help cast it because then if you use power stones plus only one color, it will still enter as a 6-6 trampler, although it's going to be pretty challenging. So for the most part, trying to play this in a monocolor deck, at which point it will be pretty good. But um, yeah, it's quite the commitment, so can't give it more than a C. Then there's the Swift Gear Drake, 5 mana, 2-4, Drake with Flying and Haste at common. And when it enters a battlefield, put up to one target creature card from a graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. Weird ability, also kind of weird stats. Not quite sold on the Drake, gonna give it a D. And then we have the Mightstone and Weakstone, which we've already discussed when going over Urza in the multicolor section. Pretty powerful card, and uh, yeah, the ability to ramp into even bigger things is quite useful. And can always use it as removal if you're behind on board, so can't really go wrong with it. I'm gonna give this a B, but it's a pretty high B, I think. And then there's the Avenger 6 mana 5-5, five five, Shapeshifter at Uncommon, and for 1 mana until end of turn, the Avenger gets minus 1 minus 1 and gains your choice of Flying, Vigilance, Death Touch, or Haste. Sadly, Lifelink is not one of the abilities that it can gain, which would probably be one of the more relevant ones in this case. I guess if you got First Strike and Death Touch going, it would be a little bit overpowered. But uh, as is, it feels a little bit weak, like a little, just a little bit too pricey to get it going. As much as I like the design, I think it's still probably closer to a D, but maybe some decks with a ton of ramp can still make good use of it. And then a Cityscape Leveler, 8 mana for an 8-8 eight, eight artifact creature construct at Mythic. It tramples, and when you cast the spell and whenever the leveler attacks, destroy up to one target non-land permanent, and its controller creates a tapped power stone token. And as if that weren't enough, you can also unearth it for 8 mana, so you can attack one last time and take something else out. So the leveler does not mess around, and as far as creatures you want to ramp into. This is at the top of that list. So 8 mana is still a lot, but I think the set has enough support for getting to 8 mana that I'm willing to give this an S. So S for the Cityscape Leveler. Next is the Cave Guard 8 mana 8-8 eight eight construct at Uncommon, has Vigilance and Ward 4, so it makes it pretty difficult for the opponent to take it out with spot removal. And when the guard dies, add 8 colorless until end of turn, you don't lose this mana as steps and phases end. I'm a bit confused at the last ability, because for the most part if the opponent kills the guard, it's probably going to be with removal in their turn, and then you're not going to be able to make use of that 8 mana. Maybe, I guess they could try and double or triple block to take it out, and then you can still make use of that 8 mana. The main drawback with the Cave Guard is that unlike all the prototype creatures, it doesn't offer that same flexibility. So you can only cast it for 8 mana, and uh, yeah, if you don't have enough resources to get to that point, it's just going to be stranded in your hand. So that's what's keeping it from being truly powerful. 
and I'm just going to end up giving it a C. And then a portal to Phyrexia. Now we're talking nine mana artifact at Mythic. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent sacrifices three creatures. So it immediately stabilizes the board for you. And at the beginning of your upkeep, put target creature card from any graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. It's also a Phyrexian in addition to its other types. So if we get to nine mana, this probably wins us the game. Can't think of too many scenarios where it doesn't. I guess the opponent removes it right away, still loses three creatures. So it's going to be pretty tricky for them to recover. So yeah, I think this is probably not their S. Again, nine mana is a lot, but there are maybe also some ways to cheat this into play, since you can maybe discard it and then use the five mana white sorcery to bring it back. So there's still maybe some clever ways around the nine mana casting cost. But with enough power stones, we can get there, I believe. Okay, so these are all of the artifacts. Now it's time to take a look at the lands. Starting with Argoth, Sanctum of Nature, which will meld with Titania, Voice of Gaia. And as I've mentioned earlier, it is a nice ability to be able to make bear tokens repeatedly. But Milling 3 will eventually end up with uh, an empty library, which is something we cannot really afford in Limited. We've seen a few cards to maybe get around it, to put cards from our graveyard back on the bottom of our library. But uh, we're still eventually going to run out of cards. So Aragoth is nice, and I'll happily take this and play this in any of my green decks. But I'm not necessarily going to go out of my way to take it early. So probably means it lands somewhere in the C plus category. Then there's the Fortified Beachhead, which enters untapped if we can reveal a soldier or if we control a soldier making blue and white. And then for five mana, we can tap it. Don't even have to sacrifice it. And then soldiers we control get plus one plus one until end of turn. So pretty serious anthem effect. And uh, yeah, of course, great in the blue white soldier tribal archetype. So yeah, this card has a lot of potential, and I'm even going up to a B for the Beachhead. And you could of course play it in just any white and or blue deck, it doesn't have to be specifically blue-white, and it will still be very effective. Then Underground River, part of the Pain Lands of the set. So four new Pain Lands added to complete the cycle from Dominaria United. And these are all pretty good. In Dominaria it was kind of funny how some of the common dual lands were actually better than the pain lands for the domain synergies. In this set there's no domain synergy, so the pain lands are going to be nice two color lands to help fix your mana, even though there's not too many incentives to splash a third color. So for the most part you're going to be playing this in a, a two color deck and slightly improve your mana. So C plus for all the pain lands, including brush lands. Lanor Wastes and Battlefield Forge. Then we have Blast Zone, another reprint, a nice land that enters a battlefield with a charge counter, can tap it for colorless, can pay double X, tap it to put X additional charge counters on it, and for three mana tap and sacrifice to destroy each non-land permanent with mana value equal to the number of charge counters on Blast Zone. So quite the mana investment to be able to kill something expensive can of course sacrifice it right away to kill all one drops but won't be able to get rid of any tokens since it already starts with a charge counter on it still a nice utility land to have access to can maybe play this in a monocolor deck more easily than a two color deck but uh, i'll maybe still try and make room for it in a two color deck and i'll go with a c plus then there's demolition field which is Kind of a reprint of Field of Ruin, you could say, just fixed to work better in multiplayer games, but functionally does the same. Uh, I guess it doesn't force the opponent to search, which I guess is relevant in some other formats where uh, mill decks are actually happy if the opponent searches for their archive traps, but I digress. The Militian Field, not going to be very relevant in Limited since there's not many non-basic lands you need to get rid of, so for the most part it's going to make your mana base worse to include Demolition Field. So I'll give it a D. Then there's Evolving Wilds as a nice bit of mana fixing to find any basic. We'll enter tapped. So happy to have one or two copies of Evolving Wilds in my two color decks if I have some difficult mana requirements. Since mana bases in Limited are actually pretty bad if you look at the numbers. So any additional mana fixing is helpful even if it means a few tapped lands. So Evolving Wilds still gets a C plus. 
of course also important if you're looking to splash a third color and then hall of taxon is a rare lane makes colorless mana can also use it to filter into any colored mana if you pay one and then for four mana gives us a nice mana sink to make a tapped power stone token actually quite relevant in this set so this is one of the better utility lands you can get and uh, yeah very happy to have it in almost any deck especially if we're looking to ramp into something expensive so this also gets a b and then mishra's foundry at long last we've got another creature land in standard and this one's also pretty good for limiteds can tap for colorless two mana to turn into a 2-2 assembly worker artifact creature until end of turn and can also pay one mana tap it and an attacking assembly worker gets plus two plus two until end of turn there's not a ton of assembly workers but you may recall all the power plants tower and mine worker creatures those are all assembly workers that we can potentially pump so always be careful if there's a mishra's foundry involved but uh, also gets a b and then a tokasia's dig site another utility land can pay three mana tap it to surveil one so also pretty good when you're in the late game and just need a, a place to spend your mana and hopefully improve your draw steps now normally we would be done at this point but uh, Brothers War has an additional surprise in store for us, which are the retro artifacts. So in every booster of the Brothers War, there's going to be one retro frame artifact that may not be legal in standard, but will be completely fine to play in limited. So there's going to be one in each pack. They have different rarities ranging from uncommon to rare and mythic rare. So no common retro frame artifacts. Yeah, this will definitely be a part of the limited format, much like the Mystical Archive cards from Strixhaven. So they should add a bit of replayability to the set, which is always fun. Now, if you actually look at kind of the, the stats of all of these retro artifacts, there's quite a few bad ones out there. So I would say about one third are unplayable, and then there's another third that's fine. And then the final third actually includes some exciting cards and most of those are the rares and mythics so the power level of the retro artifacts maybe not quite as high as let's say the mystical archives on average but uh, they still add a nice additional uh, dimension to the limited set so we'll start out as i've done with the other colors with the lowest mana value first and that is bone saw zero mana for an equipment gets plus one plus so if we equip for one mana just not quite impactful enough for limited i'm afraid so bone saw gets a d then there's mishra's bauble and while all the retro artifacts will be illegal in historic mishra's bauble they've already announced will not be illegal in historic since it's already wreaking havoc in other formats so that's understandable as far as the limited environment goes mishra's bauble is not bad can play it, play it for zero mana so it's free can tap and sacrifice the bauble to look at the top card of target player's library so you can take a peek at the opponent's deck and then draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep so if you're playing in paper make sure to put a reminder somewhere so you don't forget to draw the extra card but uh, yeah there is a couple interesting synergies with mishra's bauble since at first glance it doesn't really do a whole lot but uh, there are some sacrifice synergies like we've seen in red thinking of maybe the uh, one mana goblin blast runner which could get plus two plus so if we sacrifice a permanent and we're gonna see a little bit later cards like scrap trawler which can also get back artifacts from the graveyard so those are spots where mishra's bubble could actually come in handy places where you want a cheap artifact to sacrifice or just need something to be sacrificed to enable some other synergy so definitely not a high priority pick but uh we'll give mishra's bauble a c next is mox amber and this one we can quickly give an f since there's just very few legendary creatures in the set and uh, can't think of too many redeeming qualities for mox amber as much fun as it can be in constructed for limited it's not quite good enough then there's ornithopter this one at least is an o2 flying creature for zero mana so it has a few more applications than mox amber but still probably a card you should avoid for the most part and we'll give it a d you can maybe think of the four mana enchantment that turns an artifact into a four four that's a, a spot where ornithopter could actually be pretty good 
Then there's Chromatic Star at one mana, can help us filter our mana by paying one mana and sacrificing the star, can make one mana of any color, so we're not down on mana in that exchange, and can potentially help us play a splashed card, and then when it's put into a graveyard from the battlefield, we also draw a card. So even if we sacrifice Chromatic Star in some other way, let's say we're playing that three mana blue sorcery to make two Power Stone tokens, the splitting the Power Stone, and we sacrifice our Chromatic Star, we'll still draw a card. So that's a pretty neat synergy. And overall, just a helpful way to potentially fix our mana. So also gets a C. Next is Ivory Tower, which I can quickly give an F so we can move on. Then a Soul Guide Lantern, a one-man artifact that can act as a bit of graveyard hate. Could be relevant in a set with Unearth and other graveyard synergies. And we can always just cycle it to draw a card. So the opportunity cost is pretty low. So Lantern also gets a C. Springleaf Drum, mostly probably here as a card for Constructed. I don't think it's going to be all that uh, impressive and limited. So give Springleaf Drum a D. Altar of Dementia is an interesting one. Two mana Mythic Rare Artifact can sacrifice a creature at any point and then target player mills cards equal to the sacrificed creature's power. Okay, so this could potentially turn into a win condition. Although, again, like how many creatures do you need to sacrifice to actually mill the opponent out? Even with a 40 card deck, it's going to be quite the, uh, the journey to mill an opponent out with Altar. But I could see it happening. There's a handful of other mill cards in the uh, the retro frames here that could potentially combine with the altar. So I don't think it's completely unplayable. And also you could mill yourself with altar of dementia. So that can also potentially help with your black green graveyard deck if you just want to turbo mill yourself for some reason. So yeah, I'm not going to completely write off altar of dementia, but probably still requires a little bit too much work to be worth a card. So I'll go with a D. Then there's a Black Blade Reforged, two mana, a legendary artifact at rare. And this is a, another card we've seen on Arena before. Can give an equipped creature plus one plus one for each land you control, but it's seven mana to equip a non-legendary creature, otherwise three mana. So this one's gonna end up being a little too pricey especially with a lack of legendary creatures out there. Black Blade also gets a D. Much better in a set like Dominaria. Then there's Defense Grid, two-man artifact at rare, says each spell costs three generic more to cast, except during its controller's turn. So a great way to punish counter spells. Um, as far as limited goes, not very interested. Also gets a D. Elsewhere Flask, two mana artifact, when it enters, draw a card, and we can sacrifice a flask, choose a basic land type, and then each land we control becomes that type until end of turn. Actually has a few interesting synergies with that cycle of uh, cards like Corrupts that can deal damage equal to the number of swamps we control, etc. So that's maybe a spot where the flask can come in handy. And once again, an artifact that replaces itself when we play it, so we don't feel bad sacrificing it to any effect. So that gets a C. Next is Howling Mine, a classic two mana artifact. It says at the beginning of each player's draw step, if the mine is untapped, that player draws an additional card. So how do we break the symmetry, you might ask? Because if we can tap Howling Mine during the opponent's turn, then the opponent will not draw a card, whereas we'll keep drawing our two cards per turn. And there's not many ways to do it, but one exists at common in green. You may remember the uh, one mana uh, Stalwart, which can tap an untapped creature or artifact to make one mana of any color. So that's actually a combo with Howling Mine, if you can get those in play together as a way to tap the mine before the opponent gets to draw their second card and uh, keep it one-sided. So that's one of the redeeming qualities of Howling Mine. Otherwise, a symmetrical card draw effect is going to benefit the opponent as much as it does us. And of course, we had to spend the initial card casting the Howling Mine. So I'll give it a C. If we didn't have any ways of tapping the Howling Mine, this would probably not be good enough. Icar Wellspring is next, two mana artifact. 
when it enters or is put into a graveyard from the battlefield we get to draw a card so we actively want to sacrifice Icar Wellspring so plenty of ways to do that in this set so Icar Wellspring gets a C plus then Journeyer's Kites is a two mana rare artifact can pay three mana tap and search our library for a basic land card reveal it and put it into our hand so kind of an expensive ability, but if we're looking to ramp into expensive creatures, it's important that we keep hitting our land drops, and this is a great way to do that. Just be mindful that you still add enough creatures to the board that you don't fall behind, but uh, could be a nice mana sink in the late game. You can eventually get all the lands out of your deck, and then all your draws are going to be action. So that's also an advantage of the kite, but uh, yeah, still... Not an incredibly high priority card, I would say. So we'll go with C for the kite. Next is Key to the City, two mana artifact at rare. Can tap it, discard a card, and then one creature cannot be blocked this turn. And when the key becomes untapped, can pay two mana if we do draw a card. So can essentially keep paying two mana every turn to not only discard and draw or draw and discard, but also make a creature unblockable. So that's pretty neat. So it's an okay mana sink, but question is whether we have room for key to the city in our deck. Maybe more of a sideboard card in a matchup that's likely to produce a board stall. There's no madness synergies like there were in the original set where this was printed. So probably not quite as good as it used to be, but uh, still potentially a filler card. Give it a C. Liquid Metal Coating, a two mana artifact, can tap and then target permanent, becomes an artifact in addition to its other types until end of turn. So there's a few interesting constructed applications with this, but uh, as far as the limit is concerned, I guess it can turn a non artifact creature into something you can disenchant, for instance, but there should be enough targets out there that you don't need to play coating in the first place. So this one gets a D. Maze Mind Tome is back, and this one's great. Two mana to play. Can tap it right away to scry one, put a page counter on it, and then if it reaches a fourth counter, we have to exile it and gain four life. But we can also pay two mana, tap, put a page counter on it, and draw a card. So if we spend all ten mana, I guess, we can draw four cards and gain four life. But it's just a, a nice kind of mana sink to spend any excess mana and improve our draw steps. So this one gets a B. Then there's Mesmeric Orb, and this one is pretty wild. Two mana Mythic Rare Artifact says whenever a permanent becomes untapped, including lands, that permanent's controller mills a card. So this will quickly kind of turn the game into a game about milling, since it doesn't take very many turns of someone untapping with all their lands to end up decking to Mesmeric Orb. If you're the one playing it first, then the opponent will be the one untapping all their lands and creatures, potentially milling a whole bunch. And then uh, if they're not careful, they're going to be the ones decking first. But of course, you got to make sure you don't lose on the board at the same time. And then once players realize that uh, decking is a concern, they might end up just not casting anything and it turns into a weird staring contest. So not really looking forward to seeing this in limited, but uh, yeah, I mean, I have to recognize its power level, even though it's kind of a, a strange one. So I'll give it a C. Then there's Millstone. This one's a bit more straightforward. Two mana to play, two mana to tap, and target player mills two cards. So if you want to mill an opponent out, there are a few tools available. This is one of them. Just draft a very defensive deck, get a couple Millstones in there, and then you don't need to attack the opponent to win the game. Although, just have to be careful with opposing unearth synergies that you might be enabling. So, Millstone could be playable. I'll give it a C. Then there's Phyrexian Revoker, 2 mana, 2 1. When it enters, choose a non land card name and activated abilities of sources with a chosen name it cannot be activated. So, you can maybe shut down one of those artifacts with an activated ability. A fine filler card. There's not a ton of activated abilities in every single limited game, so it may end up uh, kind of missing a target. But uh, yeah, still playable 2-drop. It's a 2-1 at the end of the day. 
Rune Chanter's Pike he used to be a major player in standard during the Delver days, but uh, in this format it's not going to be particularly impressive. Two mana rare equipments, equips for two mana, giving the equipped creature first strike and plus X plus O, where X is the number of instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard. First strike is nice, but uh, there's not going to be a ton of instants and sorceries in most decks, so maybe in a very dedicated blue-red spells deck this could be worth it. But outside of those, I don't think the pike is going to make the cut very often. So we'll give it a D. Then there's Sigil of Valor, which basically gives one of your creatures mass exalted. Equips for one mana, and then whenever a equipped creature attacks alone, it gets plus one plus one until end of turn for each other creature you control. So it can be kind of an interesting equipment under the right circumstances, maybe you've got a ton of tokens and then maybe one life-linking creature for instance, or maybe a first strike creature, and then a Sigil of Valor is a way to still get in while keeping your blockers back for an opposing attack. So yeah, I think it's a playable card, um, but probably not one I'm gonna highly prioritize during the draft, so we'll give it a C. Then the Swiftfoot Boots are probably going to be important for Brawl, but they're also fine for Limited, I think. Two mana to play, one to equip, to give Hexproof and Haste, so we can protect our valuable creatures. And if we're yeah looking to ramp into some expensive cards, one additional mana to give Haste is also relevant, so it may be worth the wait to get in with Haste and secure with Hexproof. So the Boots seem playable as far as equipment go, especially if you're trying to play some high value targets, maybe some bombs that you want to protect. So the boots will get a C plus. Sword of the Meek, two mana to play, two to equip, gives plus one plus two. And whenever a one one creature enters a battlefield, we can return the sword from our graveyard attached to that one one creature. Used to be a part of a combo in modern don't think it's quite going to have the same impact and limited, so this one also gets a D. Then there's Thorn of Amethyst, two mana artifact at rare, saying non-creature spells cost one more to cast, so similar to Thalia. Problem here is we're not getting a 2-1 first strike, we're just getting a two mana artifact, so this one's not particularly exciting. Gets a D as well. And then Astral Cornucopia I put at three mana since we're Gonna cast it for three mana for the most part. Sometimes we can cast it for six mana, in which case X equals two, and then we can tap it to add, in the case of three mana, one mana of any color, in the case of X equals two, two mana of any color. So a nice ramp artifact, which is always welcome in a format like this one. So Cornucopia gets a C. Adaptive Automaton is mostly gonna be naming either Construct, since there's a lot of Construct artifact creatures in this set, or Soldier, another very relevant creature type. It's a 2-2, as it enters the battlefield, as we mentioned, we have to choose a creature type, and then the Automaton is the chosen type in addition to its other types, and other creatures you control of the chosen type also get plus one plus one, so gonna be at its best in the blue-white Soldier tribal deck, but even outside of it you can probably find a nice overlap of creature types to make it worthwhile. So the Automaton gets a B. And then Ashnot's Altar, finally going to be on Arena. Three mana artifact, can sacrifice a creature at any point to add double colorless. So this is known to enable some infinite combos in Commander. Is it going to be the same in Limited? I don't quite think so. Could still be an interesting enabler. We've seen some recursive creatures that can keep coming back from the graveyard over and over. So that's potentially uh, a combo you want to look for. Can help you ramp into your bigger creatures by maybe sacking some tokens. Still seems like a card that requires a bit of setup, but the payoff could definitely be worth it. So I'll give it a C. And then there's a Burnished Heart, three mana for a 2-2 Elk. Can pay three mana and sacrifice it to search our library for up to two basic land cards and put them on the battlefield tapped. So that's pretty refreshing after having all those power stone tokens. So this is a way to actually ramp into some non-artifact spells as well. 
can uh, chum block with a heart before sacrificing it to maybe soak up some damage. So that's another important play pattern. And uh, yeah, I like at least a C plus for Burnished Heart. Next is Chromatic Lantern, which could enable some interesting shenanigans as it can tap for one man of any color and also turns all our lands into multicolor lands. So this one also gets a C plus. Cloud Key, three mana artifacts. As it enters, choose artifact, creature, enchantment, instant, or sorcery. So probably going to be either artifact or a creature. And then spells you cast of the chosen type cost one less to cast. So another interesting ramp artifact. Not sure if it's really any better than just a regular three mana ramp artifact. So just gets a C. Then there's Foundry Inspector, 3 mana, 3-2, three, saying artifact spells you cast cost 1 generic less to cast. This one's pretty good, gives you a creature in addition to a mana discount. That's a C+. Then Inspiring Statuary, 3 mana, saying non-artifact spells you cast have Improvise. So now we can use our artifacts to help cast our non-artifact spells. So this one's pretty strange in this set when almost all the expensive cards are artifacts. So I'm not really a fan of statuary in this context, but I guess there's a handful of expensive non-artifact spells that you can maybe cheat into play with this. Next is the Tome, 3 mana to play, 2 mana to tap, and then a draw and a discard a card. So a pretty expensive way to loot. We've definitely seen better loot engines. So this one's kind of uh, cuttable, I would say, and not particularly exciting, gets a D. Then there's Pristine Talisman, 3 mana to tap, make a colorless, and gain 1 life. Always fun to have some repeatable life gain on a card that's already a fine addition to most decks in this format. So this one gets a C+. Then a Quietus Spike, 3 mana equipment at rare. Equipped creature has Death Touch, equips for 3 mana, and then whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, that player loses half their life rounded up. So especially nice with a flying creature, uh, if you can connect with it and chunk the opponent's life total. Otherwise, I'm not sure how impactful Death Touch is going to be after spending six mana to equip a creature. That's kind of pricey. So not the biggest fan of the spike overall, but uh, under the right circumstances, it could be playable. So going to land on a C for quite a spike. Then there's Scrap Trawler, which I mentioned earlier when talking about uh, Mishra's Bauble. 3 mana for a 3-2 rare artifact creature construct. And then whenever Scrap Trawler or another artifact creature we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, return to our hand target artifact card in our graveyard with a lesser mana value. So... Not too difficult to set up a nice recursion chain where you have some one, two, maybe even zero mana artifacts that you can keep getting back from the graveyard with Scrap Trawler after sacrificing them. So going to be at its best in probably like a red-black sacrifice deck. And uh, yeah, this could be a nice source of card advantage. I'll give it a C+. It does require a bit of setup to really be worth it. And then a Sculpting Steel, a three mana artifact, a rare enters a battlefield as a copy of any artifact on the battlefield, including opposing artifacts potentially, and there's potentially some very expensive ones out there. So Sculpting Steel has quite a bit of potential, and I think I'm willing to go up to a B for it. Then a Semblance Anvil, 3 mana, a rare artifact with imprint. So when it enters a battlefield, we may exile a non-land card from our hand, presumably a creature or artifact. And then spells we cast that share a card type with the exiled card cost two generic mana less to cast. So this could potentially ramp for two, which is pretty significant, but it will also cost us an extra card. So that may or may not be worth it. So it's a pretty big commitment, but uh, under the right circumstances could lead to some very explosive starts. So I'll go with C plus for Anvil. Next is Staff of Domination, three mana for Mythic Rare Artifact and then has a set of different abilities. Can gain one life for two mana if we tap it, three mana to untap a creature, four mana to tap an opposing creature maybe, and five mana to draw a card. And for one mana we can untap the staff, so if we have 10 plus mana we can maybe activate it twice in the same turn. 
pretty expensive all around, but we're playing in a format with lots of uh, Power Stone tokens to add more mana, so that also factors into it. So I think this could still be playable under the right circumstances. Go with a C. And then Ether Flux Reservoir, I'm just gonna give an F. Can gain a little bit of life, but I don't really see a deck casting three plus spells in the same turn. So I don't think it's realistic to ever get to 50 life, which is the goal with this. So I'll uh, just give it an F. Next is Goblin Charbelcher. This one's pretty interesting, typically played in combo decks to just one hit KO the opponent. How does it play out if we just play it in a regular deck? Probably has to be a red deck for it to be most effective. So four mana to play, then a three mana to tap, reveal cards from the top of our library until we reveal a land card, and then a Charbelcher deals damage equal to the number of non-land cards revealed this way to any target but we have to choose a target before we really end up revealing the cards, so there's a bit of a randomness factor there. And then if the revealed card was a mountain, the Char Belcher deals double that damage instead, and then the revealed cards go on the bottom of our library. So realistically, let's say we're playing a heavy red deck, we activate Char Belcher, targeting the opponent's, let's say, a 3-3, then we would have to reveal two non-land cards before revealing a mountain to be able to deal four damage. That's not always going to be the case. So yeah, this one's pretty high uh, variance, I would say. And on average, I don't think it's going to be particularly exciting. So I'll go with D for Charbelcher, even in a red deck. Then there's Helm of the Host, four mana for a legendary artifact equipment, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a token that's a copy of equipped creature, except the token isn't legendary, and if the equipped creature is legendary, and that token also gains haste. So Helm of the Host, a powerful reprint from the original Dominaria. It is expensive to equip, 5 mana, but the payoff is certainly there, as we immediately get to copy a creature, give it haste. So this card can very quickly get out of hand, and uh, yeah, I think I'm willing to give it an A, bomb level card, even though this set might have more answers to artifacts than a regular set, which may make it slightly weaker overall. And then Lodestone Golem, 4 mana for a 5-3, saying non-artifact spells cost 1 more to cast. Well, most of the expensive cards in this set are artifacts, so making non-artifacts more expensive is not all that relevant. So Lodestone Golem seems a little awkward here, um, so I'll just end up giving it a C, still a creature we can play and can attack and block, but not all that exciting. Then there's Mystic Forge, this one has quite a bit of potential in this set, 4 mana for an artifact at Mythic, saying we may look at the top card of our library at any time, and cast artifact spells and colorless spells from the top of our library, and can also tap it, pay one life to exile the top card of our library if we don't like it. Maybe there's a land on top, for instance. So yeah, Mystic Forge has the potential of being a very powerful card draw engine in a deck filled with artifacts, which is kind of a prerequisite, otherwise it's not gonna be particularly powerful. But uh, yeah, in the right deck, I think this is good enough to maybe get up to the B range. And next we have... Perilous Vault, 4 mana Mythic Rare Artifact, can pay 5 mana, tap and exile it to exile all non-land permanents. So similar to Urza's Silex, and uh, yeah, this one you can play in any deck, so it doesn't have to be white specifically. So definitely a nice reset button if you're looking for one. So gonna be at its best in a more controlling deck that has tons of card draw to go alongside it, gets a B. And then a Phyrexian Processor is an interesting one, 4 mana at Mythic here. And when it enters, you may pay any amount of life. Hopefully not enough to kill yourself. But uh, you can pay 4 mana, tap it, and create an XX Black Phyrexian Minion Creature Token, where X is the life paid as Processor entered the battlefield. I don't think there's a ton of combos with a Processor, there's no like ways to gain life equal to a creature's toughness, which would be the kind of combo you're looking for. Um, so yeah, I don't think this card's particularly good. What's like the sweet spot for Processor? I guess there's a board stall, you're not under any pressure, still at 20 life, 
and then you can maybe pay like seven or eight life to the processor and then start making an 8-8 every turn. So there are situations where this could be good, but it requires the opponent to be off to a particularly slow start, which is not always going to be the case. So I'll give it a C, playable, but asterisk. And then there's a quick silver amulet, 4 mana artifact, can pay 4 mana, tap it, to put a creature card from our hand onto the battlefield. So we've seen a 4 mana red enchantment to cheat creatures into play, although those will go away end of turn, albeit they do gain haste. This one doesn't gain haste, but we can also activate it in the opponent's turn to maybe present a blocker out of nowhere. And uh, there's no shortage of expensive prototype creatures that we can put in play with Amulet. So I actually think this could be pretty good in this format. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go up to, at the very least, a C+. Then there's Unwinding, a clock, 4 mana, rare artifact, saying untap all artifacts you control during each other player's untap step. So Power Stone tokens get to untap to maybe activate an ability once again. All our artifact creatures untap, giving them pseudo vigilance, and there may be some other utility artifacts that we can untap with it. So there are situations where the clock could actually be a worthwhile inclusion, especially in artifact heavy decks. On average, probably not a card I'm looking to play, but uh, still gotta recognize its power level. So we'll go with a C. And then there's a Well of Lost Dreams, 4 mana artifact that cares about life gain, saying whenever we gain life we may pay X, where X is less than or equal to the amount of life we've gained, and if we do, draw X cards. Again, there's not a lot of life gain synergies across this set, so I don't think you're going to have an easy time enabling the Well, so sadly gets a D. And then a Gilded Lotus is back, 5 mana artifact, tapping for 3 mana of any one color. Great way to get to those expensive prototype creatures. And uh, yeah, not much more to say about it. Great ramp card, gets a B. Mind's Eye, 5 mana Mythic Rare artifact, saying whenever an opponent draws a card, we may pay 1 generic mana if we do draw a card as well. So kind of expensive to get out there. But then if we can keep it up, it's basically one mana every turn to draw one extra card, since the opponent will draw for their draw step. So yeah, if you can get to five mana, this will help you take over the late game, kind of like a personalized uh, Howling Mine, even though it does require a well, one mana payment each turn if you want to keep it up. So has potential, kind of expensive, but uh, I think most decks will still benefit from it. C+. Plus. Then a Precursor Golem is an interesting one. 5 mana for a 3-3 three, three, that when it enters the battlefield creates two 3-3 three, three colorless Golem artifact creature tokens and then says whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell that targets only a single Golem, that player copies that spell for each other Golem that spell could target and each copy targets a different one of those Golems. So let's assume there's no additional Golems in play, just a Precursor and the two tokens we generate. It could be both an advantage, but it could also be a drawback. Let's say the opponent has a spot removal spell, saying deal three damage to a creature. Now they get to take out all three golems for just one spell. On the other hand, if we have a pump spell, we can now pump all three of our golems. So giant growth turns into nine extra power and toughness. So yeah, the golem's definitely an interesting card to play with and against. But uh, assuming no additional interaction, adding 9 power and toughness to the board for 5 mana is a pretty good deal. So overall, I think the Precursor is pretty good, and at least a C+. And then the Psychosis Crawler, 5 mana for a star star, Phyrexian Horror at rare. Power and toughness each equal to the number of cards in your hand, and whenever you draw a card, each opponent loses one life. Not really a fan of this one, since you tend to be close to empty-handed by the time you play the Crawler, so it's not going to be very big, and uh, yeah, draining the opponent for one is nice, but probably not worth the mana investment. So I'm going to go with a D for Crawler. Then a Self-Assembler is back, 5 mana, Artifact Creature Assembly Worker at Uncommon, and it used to be the only assembly worker in uh, Kaladesh where it was originally printed, so it could only find copies of itself. 
And then when self-assembler enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an assembly worker, put it into your hands and then shuffle. So now with the whole uh, power plants, mine and tower worker that are also assembly workers, self-assembler could actually help you assemble the trifecta. So that's a pretty fun addition, I think, in this set. You can either draft multiple self-assemblers to get additional copies of itself, turning it into a pretty nice five drop, or you can try and set up the uh, power plant mine and tower combo, which could also be pretty fun. So C plus for the self-assembler. Then door to nothingness is the type of card where you probably want access to a chromatic lantern to help you enable it. A five mana rare artifact enters tapped and then two of each color tap and sacrifice door to nothingness target player loses the game so that's a, a fun win condition so yeah getting two of each color is going to be the main challenge getting to uh, 10 mana i guess is also not that easy but uh you'll probably need your chromatic lantern to activate it so a fun challenge but uh probably going to have to turn it down for the most part gets a d Although Ramos Dragon Engine is another way we could potentially activate our uh, five mana door to nothingness. A six mana, four four mythic rare legendary artifact creature dragon with flying, saying whenever we cast a spell, put a plus one counter on Ramos for each of that spell's colors. So monocolor spells one counter, two color spells two counters, and then we can remove five plus one plus one counters from Ramos to add two of each color and can only activate it once each turn. So yeah, that uh, sets up our door to nothingness nicely if we get to live the dream. And the overall dragon engine, kind of expensive, slow to pick up plus one counters, but it's still a big flyer, so C+. And then a caged sun, six mana mythic rare artifact. When it enters, choose a color. Creatures of the chosen color get plus one plus one. So potentially another incentive for a monocolored deck. We've seen a few of them so far. And then whenever a land's ability causes you to add one or more mana of the chosen color, add an additional mana of that color. So yeah, under the right circumstances, this can essentially double our mana production, which can be incredibly powerful. But even in a two color deck that's predominantly one color, it could still be quite powerful. So I think Cage Sun gets a B. And then a Keening Stone, another potential mill engine, a six mana a rare artifact can pay five mana tap it and then target player mills x cards where x is the number of cards in that player's graveyard so at first it may not mill much but it doesn't take too many activations to win you the game i'm probably guessing three activations gets you close to lethal so question is can we afford to pay six mana and then another 15 mana essentially not impacting the board and uh, maybe if you build your deck around it, you've got lots of early blockers. It could work out. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty big if. Uh, I'll give it a C. And then Wormcoil Engine. We saved our best for last here. 6 mana, 6-6, six, six, Mythic Rare, Artifact Creature, Phyrexian, Worm, with Death Touch and Lifelink. And when the engine dies, create a 3-3 three, three Phyrexian Worm token with Death Touch and another one with Lifelink. This card's a nightmare to deal with, very difficult to race, and even if you kill it under most circumstances, it's going to leave behind two more tokens. So yeah, this card is as close to it gets as a, a to an S. Also not too expensive at six mana, so you can realistically cast it in most games, and there's only a handful of removal spells that can cleanly take care of the worm coil. So that's the S tier. And then a Platinum Angel at 7 mana, a 4-4 Flyer at Mythic, saying you cannot lose the game and your opponents cannot win the game. So I guess the dream is to put uh, Swiftfoot Boots on the Angel so it also gains Hexproof, and then there's not too many answers left. Otherwise, it's just going to require the opponent to eventually use a removal spell on the Angel, which the opponent may or may not have. Let's say they're playing a blue-white deck and their removal is all enchantment-based, they may not be able to actually get rid of the Platinum Angel. So there will be circumstances where this just uh, wins you the game on the spot. But of course also a 7 mana 4-4 four, four Flyer, not particularly impressive in terms of stats. So if the opponent does have an answer at the ready, then uh, this is not necessarily going to help your cause. 
So C plus for Platinum Angel, I think it still has enough potential. And then last is Sundering Titan, 8 mana, 7, 10 artifact creature Golem at Mythic. When it enters a battlefield or leaves a battlefield, choose a land of each basic land type and then destroy those lands. Now this is not a May ability, so let's say you're playing a red-white deck, the opponent's playing a blue-green deck. This will force you to destroy your own two lands as well in addition to the opponent's lands. So best case scenario, you're playing the same colors as your opponent, so you can only destroy their lands. And this will happen both when it enters and when it uh, leaves the battlefield. And a 7-10, also pretty big, so yeah, this card can be a nice curve topper if you're a ramp deck. And uh, yeah, hopefully the lands line up the way you want them to. Maybe also at its best in a monocolored deck where you can at most destroy one of your own lands and hopefully more of the opponent's. Decent card, I would say, if you're looking for an expensive curve topper. Um, so I'll go for a C+. So we had quite the journey with uh, a lot of cards in the set between the regular set and now also the retro artifact. But as another reminder, if you just want a handy dandy spreadsheet with all these card ratings combined, so you don't need to necessarily listen to the entire set review, then I've got you covered. All patrons and Twitch subscribers will have access to the tier list that I will keep up to date as I play the set more, as I'm sure some of the ratings will still change over time as the set matures. And then you'll also have access to all the other tier lists from previous expansions. So yeah, I think that's gonna wrap things up for this video. It's probably long enough already. So I wanna thank everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.